Okay, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Don, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Um, uh, now, just this last week was Earth Day, and so, uh, consistent with that holiday, uh, we're having Dennis Nelson uh, tonight as our speaker. Uh, he, Dennis Nelson is from the Nuclear Energy Information Service, and he's going to be talking about uh, a number of environmental issues. Now, uh, if there are no more announcements, then without further ado, let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker of the evening, Dennis Nelson. Thanks everybody for coming. Again, as Don said, that uh, among other things, that uh, April is Earth Month, Mike, and that uh, this is Earth Week, and that Tuesday was Mike. Can't hear me. That's right. Please use the mic. It's, it's better when you speak in, into the mic. Okay. Or, yeah. Or around it. Or near it. There you go. In the vicinity. Okay, we'll do that. Probably for the recording, but I'm sure that people can hear me without it, but uh, okay, for the recording's sake. Okay, thanks a lot uh, mm -hmm. for, for coming uh, this evening. And we'll start again. Again, April is Earth Month, and this is Earth Week, and Tuesday was Earth Day proper. Earth Day is a celebration, but it's not official, it's, it is not an official national holiday. There's some of the environmental movement that think it should be, but I'm sure that there are Republicans in Congress, particularly in the House, that would very much would disagree with that, who deny uh, and delay climate disruption, who uh, think that more arsenic in drinking water is good, mm -hmm. and to think that the only good endangered species is an extinct species. Right. So, be that as it may. Uh, well, that's the, also part of the good news is my unofficial 44th anniversary was Monday, April 21st. There were pre-Earth Day events that I was involved with 44 years ago when I was a sophomore in high school. So not to put down Earth Day, but Earth Day was almost window dressing back then because my things happened on, the, it was, well, it was Tuesday the 21st. And Wednesday, the middle of the week in 1970, was the first Earth Day. Bad news is that today is the uh, 28th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in the Ukraine. But it's, it's very often going to be discussing some pertinent topics related with that. Uh, the presentation is in two parts. The first part is a non-NEIS um, part that I affectionately call indirectly or directly the birds and the bees. And I think when I get done with this, uh, you'll, you'll see why there was a write-up. You'll see why it was done this way. The second is about uh, thorium, the nuclear boondoggle. And I really wish that uh, John from the Thorium Energy Alliance were here uh, this evening. Of course, we, we have Tim, who's uh, a thorium advocate here. And that is particularly pertaining with Nuclear Energy Information Service, Illinois' Nuclear Power Watchdog Group, which I'm a board member and vice president. So let's get started with the first section. We're going to talk a success story. This law I'm going to talk about was signed into law by uh, Governor Pat Quinn. Uh, Jeff is not here uh, this evening, and last year he raised the good question that, what good does all this do in terms of all my action alerts and everything that I'm doing? Is there any good that comes from it? This is an example. This was actually uh, sent to my state representative. It was April 25th of last year, so it talks about last year's Earth Day. But this bill is to support accurate sexual health education was uh, signed into law by our governor. So vote, and it's uh, Planned Parenthood of Illinois did the action alert. Vote yes on HB 2675, Accurate Sexual Health Education. As a constituent concerned with providing teens in grades 6 to 12 with all the information and education needed to make healthy and responsible decisions about all aspects of their sexual health, I hope that you will join me in supporting HB 2675, the Accurate Sexual Health Education Bill. Illinois currently does not require that schools teaching sexual health provide medically accurate, age-appropriate, and complete information to students. HB 2675 creates a standard for existing sexual health 
courses by incorporating age-appropriate scientific research and information about reducing unintended pregnancies and STDs and STLs in 6th through 12th grade classes while ensuring that those classes, I guess STIs, while ensuring that those classes continue to stress abstinence. Under the Accurate Sexual Health Education Bill, local school boards still select the specific uh, curricula to be used in their classrooms, not the state. Local school authorities would decide what is age appropriate. What's more, the actual sexual health education bill empowers parents by allowing parents and guardians to review the curricula and remove their children from classes if they do not want them to participate. And these are my added comments. First off, I talk about, you know, Earth Day, uh, the 23rd annual Earth Day, and this and that. And having been active since around the first Earth Day, the overall subject of overpopulation, population policy, population reduction, and stabilization is now akin to the 800-pound African mountain gorilla sitting in a back room, in the back corner of a room, and environmental meetings, conferences, seminars, and workshops that everybody ignores and does not want to deal with. The subject used to get a great deal more attention than it does now. The subject of responsible population and sex education is a top priority of still great relevance that should be pushed harder. It is time to make sure that our young people have the educational tools to st stay safe and healthy and to live meaningful, productive lives. As an energy environmental researcher, I share a vision of our future held by ecologists of a truly sustainable society with a reduced, stabilized population size in which we and our descendants can enjoy safe, secure, and culturally rich lifestyles. And for what it is worth, uh, over the past 44 years, I have read numerous books, articles, and other materials about overpopulation, population policy, population reduction, stabilization. I'm not going to mention it. It's quite a list, but it basically mentions the books by uh, Dr. Paul R. Ehrlich from Stanford University, his wife, Anne H. Ehrlich, who is also a biologist, and John Holdren. If anybody wants to see the complete list, um, I've, got, I've got it here, but we'll continue on. Okay, this was signed on Thursday, September 26th of last year. This is from the Population Council to the U.S. Governors. Help end poverty, invest in girls. If we improve adolescent girls' health, keep them safe and in school, prevent child marriage, and give them mentoring, social support, and financial literacy, they, their families, and their communities will prosper. Yet many girls, particularly in the developing world, are excluded from school, community participation, and meaningful life livelihoods. The Population Council is at the forefront of research, analysis, and program design for adolescent girls in the developing world. Our data show that when we invest in girls, they become more empowered, more productive, and more economically stable. Spread the word. Help us raise awareness of important research policies and programs that uplift and empower young girls around the world. This was signed the very, at the same day by Population Council, also to the U.S. Governors, support innovation access to dependable contraception. Today, 220 million women in the developing world would like to deny or stop childbearing, but are not using a modern method of contraception. Their choices may be limited by a lack of dependable access to methods that meet their needs and lifestyle, resistance from family or community, or even lack of awareness of their options. Population Council researchers are developing a contraceptive vaginal ring that will be effective for one year. The ring will not require refrigeration during storage and distribution, making it an attractive option for women and providers in remote areas. Once approved, the ring will provide women with a safe and effective contraceptive method that is fully under their control. Support expanded access to contraceptives that give women the power to plan their families and live healthier and more productive lives. Global communities take the pledge, signed uh, September 26th of last year. Support investing in women 
it's a lot of repetition, and so we'll just move on, just examples of the, the things that are out there. Just from the CARE 2 petition site. All women deserve reproductive freedom regardless of income. From the National Council of Jewish Women, and that was signed on December 21st of last year. This is from the Center for Biological Diversity from uh, Tucson, Arizona. And this was signed on uh, December 16th of last year. This new year resolved to help the planet. New, year, new Year's is a time for making resolutions and tackling tough issues. So there's no better time to talk about the massive impact human population growth and overconsumption are having on the survival prospects of other species. Polar bears are on thin ice. Sea turtles are in hot water. What are you water. missing? Lesser known creatures like hellbenders are threatened too, without most people even knowing what they are. They're, they're a very large salamander, you know what they are. All of these animals and countless others face incredible pressures from the more than 7 billion people on the planet. Make it your New Year's resolution this year to help protect our world and the species we've shared with it for so many millennia. Seven billion people means seven billion reasons we need to talk about population in the future. Join us in taking the pledge for a wildlife-friendly 2014, then share this with your friends and family. I pledge to do my part to stem spiraling popu human population growth and overconsumption by buying less, avoid the carbon cost of shopping, why not donate instead, driving less, the climate's not getting any cooler, Meeting less, M-E-A-T-I-N-G, less. Eat earth-friendly, one meatless meal at a time. Humping smarter. Save sex, save species. EndangeredSpeciesCondoms.com. Talking population. Wildlife are depending on us to make the connection between human population growth and the extinction <coughs> crisis. Well, for Valentine's Day this year, which was Friday, February 14th, the Center for Biological Diversity gave away 4,000 free endangered species condoms in St. Paul, Minnesota, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, North, South Carolina, New Orleans, Louisiana, Naples, Florida, and Honolulu, Hawaii. They were wrapped in colorful packages featuring six endangered animal species, polar bear, Florida panther, western snowy plover, which is a, a shorebird, Hellbender, the large salamander we mentioned before, and dwarf seahorse. And again, make the connection and draw the links between our population growth and species extinction. Last year, uh, there was a 50th commemoration, 50th year commemoration I did of the publishing of Rachel Carson Silent Hello? Spring. I mentioned about the bee killing pesticides and uh, well if you didn't know about it you heard about it first here because in the past year this campaign to get rid of these things has really taken off. This is a, an action alert that Charlie sent me from Greenpeace. It goes to uh, well US EPA Secretary Gina McCarthy and it's to save birds from uh, save bees from uh, So Floxifor. Well today, Friday, February 14, 2014, is officially Valentine's Day. Besides the traditional cards, flowers, candy, and romantic dinners with movies combos, this is the time to show some love for the declining populations of honeybees. These bees and other pollinators have the essential non-irreplaceable ecological niche or role or job in our planet's natural natural environmental life support systems of being responsible for two-thirds of our food crops. On Tuesday, February 11th, I hand-delivered my Show Bee Some Love, Stop Selling Bee Killing Pesticides Valentine to the Home Depot store in Chicago's South Loop, downtown area at Clinton and Roosevelt. Continuing on, as one of the longer-term, longer-time environmental activists since around the very first Earth Day, Wednesday, April 22, 1970. A major focus of mine has been the elimination of dangerous toxic chemical pesticides and the promotion of integrated pest management, biological pest control. Uh, this will protect public health and environmental health. 
In fact, as a part of my senior college year, environmental studies seminar, I did a presentation about the latter part of this very topic. I graduated from Dana College, Blair, Nebraska with a Bachelor of Science, BS degree in Biology and Environmental Studies. Please quickly reconsider your decision to allow the broadcast use of the hazardous chemical neonatinoid pesticide sulfoxaflor. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's U.S. EPA's own reports have found that sulfoxaflor is highly toxic to PB <coughs> populations which are under increased stress because of widespread colony collapse disorder or CCD. The significant decrease of honeybees both in the wild and in agriculture puts natural ecological systems and our food at risk. Please follow the lead of the European Union, EU, and immediately and totally ban the use of all neonicotinoids in order to save honeybee populations from a complete collapse to improve the quality of our lives and to improve our health. Now this is an example of what was done. It was sent, this is the Center for Food Safety and um, Friends of the Earth and, uh, public and, and groups that had the campaign. This is just briefly what was given. I, I, I took uh, the, the Home Depot store, it was the colorized version. It says Lowe's, but it's the colorized version that went to Home Depot. It's basically what I delivered um, along, with, uh, along with a colored thing that shows me some love. And that's the, the ban bee killing pesticides and plants that are treated by it. Kind of a, 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 a cute, a good campaign that um, oh. people were um, encouraged yeah, to do. This is from the Sierra Club. It was uh, sent Earth Day of this year, uh, this past Tuesday. And it was sent to my U.S. Representative, Dan Lipinski. And some of this is repetitious, but the important thing is, is that I encourage Lipinski to support the Saving America's uh, Pollinators Act, H.R. 2692. And it would protect bees by requiring the U.S. EPA to suspend the use of uh, four of the bee-killing uh, pesticides that we, we, we've been talking about until their safety can be determined. It would also charge the U.S. EPA with monitoring uh, bee health. Now we get to a couple things about bird conservation. This was sent to the uh, headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Washington, D.C. I used their contact, I, their contact form. It was sent uh, Monday, February 21st of this year. Uh, please protect bald eagles and their habitat along the middle Mississippi River. As an experienced wildlife watcher, an avid hiker, and an amateur photographer, I have observed bald eagles are a majestic national bird while on a river float trip through the Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve near Haines, near Haines, Alaska, and at the Mendenhall Glacier in the Tongass National Forest, southeast Alaska's Inside Passage during July 1995. I graduated from Dana College, Blair, Nebraska, with a Bachelor of Science, BS degree in Biology and Environmental Studies. In my college ornithology class, I took field trips to the Soto National Wildlife Refuge Iowa and Nebraska along the uh, Missouri River where bald eagles were sighted. Well, continuing on, it would be great to go bald eagle watching along the middle of Mississippi yeah. River. During the months of December through March, the majority concentrations of bald eagles in the entire continental United States winter near the open waters at the locks and dams of the Mississippi River. There are around 2,000 bald eagles which migrate to the middle Mississippi River. This is all the more reason for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to immediately halt the construction of harmful river structures in the middle section of the Mississippi River and to encourage important management changes in order to reduce the harm to the habitat of the bald eagles. Over 1,375 of these structures were built by the Corps to reduce the cost of dredging the Mississippi River for navigation. However, the mismanagement has ended up harming the habitat and fisheries which the bald eagles depend upon. Concerning your upcoming study to re review environmental and health impacts and then to determine other actions to either minimize or mitigate those impacts, please take a more thorough scientific look 
at the impacts of your river construction projects and then urge alternative, a lot more ecologically friendly methods. Again, as a naturalist and environmental researcher, I urge the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to improve your river management projects and to make them much more wildlife friendly. In fact, what is bad for ball animals is also bad for people. Over 50 peer-reviewed scientific studies show that river structures, such as those being constructed by the Corps, significantly increase the risk of floods for riverside communities. Well, it is my informed opinion that it is high time for the Mississippi River to be managed to protect both people and wildlife. The Corps should stop building newer river structures until the comprehensive review of their impacts is finished. In conclusion, I call for a thorough and comprehensive analysis of newer, less destructive methods for managing the navigation on the Mississippi River, which work to provide a win-win situation for both people and wildlife. Next we have an action alert from the Sierra Club and sign the petition to protect bald eagles from the NRA. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we, can get that, we can get into that later on. We've got a lot to say about that. Close to our senators, uh, Mark Kirk and uh, Dick Durbin. And please oppose the Sportsman's Heritage and Recreational Enhancement <laughs> Share Act. This was sent uh, February 15th of this year. As an experienced bird or bird watcher with a life list of over 500 different bird species, I urge you to stand up to the National Rifle Association, NRA, and lead ammo manufacturers and oppose the Sportsman's Heritage and Recreational Enhancement Share Act to protect our wildlife from toxic lead poisoning. Lead is a known neurotoxin and spent lead from hunting is a widespread killer of over 75 species of birds such as bald eagles, endangered condors, loons and swans, and almost 50 mammals. It even endangers hunters and their families who consume game riddled with lead fragments. The NRA has fought long and hard to keep poisonous lead ammunition on, shores, on sh store shelves, deliberately spreading misinformation and attacking environmental activists, wildlife biologists, and even zoos. If passed, the, this extremist legislation will block the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA, from protecting millions of birds and other wildlife from lead poisoning. This terrible bill also contains provisions to undermine the Wilderness Act, dispense with environmental review for, pro for projects on our national wildlife refuges, and promote polar bear hunting. Affordable, effective, non-toxic alternatives exist for lead ammunition and lead sinkers for all hunting and fishing activities. We've already taken the lead out of gasoline, plumbing, and paint. The U.S. military is even moving to non-lead ammo. In conclusion, I urge you to oppose the Sportsman's Heritage and Recreational Enhancement Act. It is way past time to get the lead out. We need an immediate and permanent ban on all toxic lead, ammo, and fishing tackle. This goes to, again, uh, Lipinski, Durbin, and Kirk. This is from the National Audubon Society. This is to restore bird conservation funding. It was sent September 26th of last year. As a constituent and Audubon supporter, I urge you to restore funding for critical bird conservation programs like the state wildlife grants, the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and other interior and EPA programs contained in the Interior Appropriations Bill. The funding levels in this bill are wholly inadequate to address the needs of wildlife conservation and habitat restoration. The conservation programs in this bill are cost-effective and proven programs that provide critical resources to protect and restore habitat, provide money to states to execute conservation on the ground, and money to restore areas like the Great Lakes and Long Island Sound. The Interior Appropriations Bill cuts funding for endangered species recovery, restricts the creation or expansion of wildlife refuges, and limits funds to aid migratory bird species, critical in their role at roles as pollinators, seed dispersers, 
and insect control. Dollars spent on refuges, state parks, restoration, and land acquisition benefit the economy through tourism, hunting, fishing, outdoor recreation, and restoration work. Investments in conservation are smart, returning more than double the investment for every dollar spent. I urge you to invest in the future of our children and restore funding for these conservation programs in the Interior Appropriations Bill. We all need and want healthy waterways, productive landscapes, and abundant wildlife. Thank you for your attention to this critically important conservation issue. And we are through with the birds and the bees. And now we're on to the second part of our presentation, the NEIS stuff. Are thorium-powered molten salt reactors a solution to the U.S. energy need, to U.S. energy needs? Here we go. Are they just another nuclear boondoggle? And Charlie, here we go. As a big part of our pro-nuclear mythology, in 1954, mm -hmm. Louis you, Strauss, you. chairman of the United States yes, Atomic I'm Energy Commission, that. USADC, made the wildly over-optimistic claim that nuclear power would provide electricity, quote, too cheap to meet, or unquote. We know what happened to that one. Well, the pro-nuclear mythology is alive and well. Science writer Richard Martin calls thorium a super fuel, mm -hmm. the green energy source for the future. And I'm just supposed to roll my eyes and ooh and ah, and everything's going to be wonderful, but it's not. As a longtime energy environmental activist, I simply do not buy it. Calling thorium a so-called superfuel is a fraud. This is because thorium cannot be a nuclear fuel by itself. The real superfuels are things like solar and wind. They are renewable, abundant, inherently cleaner and safer, free, and fuels by themselves. No non-renewable nuclear fuel is green anyway. As we will soon see, thorium is either black or brown. I'm not talking about the color of the fuel. I'm talking about you know green is supposed you know is supposed to be non-polluting and and it's not you know well, brown or black means that it's inherently dirty. It's just another nuclear power boondoggle. In March of 2013, former U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission U.S. NRC Chairman Gregory uh, Jaspro said that all of our nation's 104 licensed unsafe commercial nuclear reactors should be phased out. Physicist and energy consultant Amory B. Lovins, chief scientist and chairman emeritus at the Rocky Mountain Institute, carefully and thoroughly examined the combination of the rising generating costs of our current aging nuclear reactors and the rapidly falling total costs of modern renewables <coughs> last year. According to Lovins, quote, Shifting competitive conditions have begun to drive a gradual U.S. nuclear phase-out, unquote. Because of prohibitive capital cost, new reactors are much too expensive to replace the aging fleet of existing reactors. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the public policy question before us. I'm assuming that uh, the thorium advocates want to replace all of our present 104 uranium-powered light water reactors with thorium-powered molten salt reactors and to build even more than that. Do we really want and need to go through all the time, trouble, and expense reinventing and reviving commercial nuclear power with thorium the nuclear boondoggle when better choices already exist to provide all of our energy requirements? In a truly competitive energy marketplace, nuclear power in any form simply cannot exist. The nuclear industry is depending on, as well as getting away with, two pieces of pro-nuclear chicanery. The Federal Nuclear Loan Guarantee Program and State Construction Work in Progress, CWIP laws. I sent a message to Energy Secretary Ernest Monez, President Barack Obama, U.S. Representative Dan Lipinski, and U.S. Senators Dick Durbin and Mark Kirk. I urged them to stop the proposed taxpayer loan of $8.3 billion for the two new nuclear reactors, the Voctel 3 and 4, now under construction in Georgia, and to end the Federal Nuclear Loan Guarantee Program fiasco in its entirety. To add insult onto injury, Southern Company, the electric utility, also has access to the ratepayers' money okay. through Georgia's construction work in progress law. 
Zach's Investment Research, a major investment firm, has downgraded Southern Company stock and has warned that the likely cost overruns at the Volktol site could cause the final cost of the two new reactors to increase to a whopping $20 billion. The fact that these are uranium-powered light water reactors and not thorium-powered molten salt reactors is irrelevant. The indication is that any new reactor, regardless of design, will be dependent on these handouts by the taxpayers and ratepayers. The devil is in the details. By thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle would be a major part of our energy problem rather than a solution to it. It's a newer variation on the same old, same old stuff. The serious intractable proliferation, waste, environmental, health, safety, and cost problems would still be there. Earlier I called the notion of thorium being a so-called super fuel a fraud, just another nuclear deception. This is because thorium is fertile, not fissionable. You can put the radionucleotide thorium-232 in a reactor core by itself, and it will just sit there, and it will sit there, and it will sit there without any human-made sustained nuclear chain reaction happening. Thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle, needs either enriched uranium or plutonium to start and then sustain the human-made nuclear chain reaction until enough fertile thorium-232 is converted to fissionable uranium-233, another radionucleotide. Both plutonium and uranium-233 are excellent weapons-grade materials. Oh, by the way, the proliferation risk is not eliminated with a thorium fuel cycle using uranium-238, still another radionucleotide, while more uranium-238 does dilute the uranium-233, more plutonium-239 is produced. In the majority of cases with thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle, too costly and extremely dirty commercial reprocessing is needed to separate out the uranium-233 for use in new nuclear fuel. By chemically separating out the uranium and plutonium, this still poses a big proliferation risk. Commercial reprocessing produces large quantities of so-called low-level radioactive wastes, a misnomer because they're still radiotoxic. So the thorium, the nuclear boondog, will still produce high-level radioactive waste. <coughs> a thorium fuel cycle will create longer-lasting fission products like the radionucleotide te technetium-99 with a radioactive half-life of around uh, 211,000 years. What? An important public policy issue, we should immediately pulse production of any more of it. I'm talking about any more radioactive waste. Thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle, also poses unresolved environmental and health problems. The mining of thorium-232 will still produce longer-term radiotoxic waste at the front end of the thorium fuel cycle, yeah. just like uranium mining does now with the reactors that use it. Again, the public policy issue, we should not pr be producing any more of it. Continuing on, the pathway of exposure for uranium-232 is by inhalation, which is a fancy medical way of saying that you better hold your breath. <laughs> if inhaled, thorium-232 can release <clears throat> alpha and beta radiation particles besides what? gamma radiation within our bodies. There is an increased risk of developing lung disease and cancer of the lung or pancreas. The radioactive half-life of the thorium-232 is about 14 billion years, which means it will be around for a long, long time. <laughs> thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle, presents opportunities for catastrophic disasters as potential targets for terrorist groups and military attacks. I am ending this section with another important public policy issue. Thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle, I reject the entire nuclear industry because of pro-nuclear hanky-panky. We must also consider political power and corporate influence, policy priorities, behavior and assumptions and values. The history of the nuclear industry is chock full of technological arrogance, poor engineering, bad science, pervasive mismanagement, manipulation, distortion of data, lies and cover-ups, lack of transparency and accountability, and harassment and intimidation of, whistle, of nuclear whistleblowers. You cannot yeah. simply take a different reactor design and just insert it into the nuclear industrial complex, just drop it in there and then just stand back and say, well, everything's okay with nuclear power, energy problem solved. 
Um, you must consider the serious work. chronic and already mentioned non-technical problem of pro-nuclear hanky-panky being caused by the present nuclear institutional infrastructure, which cannot be resolved by more science and technology. I mentioned the Thorium Energy Alliance. I really wish that John were here because it's, it's, it's a non-profit group like NEIS is a non-profit group. Our president, Dorian Brewer, is a solar installer. He installs solar voltaic uh, panels on rooftops with his partner. And, but that's his business. As a group, we don't do that. So as a non-for-profit group, there may be people that he has that would do this, but as a non-for-profit group, the Thorium Energy Alliance doesn't do this. So that's why I, I'm singling out them by name, well, they're, they're not here uh, this evening. The Thorium Energy Alliance is not going to be constructing and operating the thorium-powered molten salt reactors. You cannot guarantee that the nuclear corporations and electric utilities will be forthcoming and honest about the real scientific and technical problems with the thorium fuel cycle. Part two, we will now examine the public policy issue of why there is no demonstrable need for thorium the nuclear power boondoggle and what we can and should use instead to provide all of our energy requirements. A physicist, Dr. Bill Keepen, research scholar, Rocky Mountain Institute, 1988. Did you it's, flunk arithmetic in grammar school? You're not, you're Excuse me, one fool at a time. Yeah, uh, one fool at a time. Uh, oh, did he flunk? I was going, uh, you know, Don said something, and I was going to, too, that there have been some problems with NEIS in particular has spoken, and I thought that Don's, you know, suggestion that we all remain civil was good enough, and I didn't say anything, but I'm saying something now. Sir, please wait for the, you can ask a question, or wait for the rebuttal, please. Okay? Dennis, Dennis. This is Dr. Bill Keepen, research scholar, Rocky Mountain Institute in 1988. Each dollar wisely invested in the best electric efficiency improvements displaces nearly seven times more carbon emissions than a dollar foolishly wasted on... There you go. Yeah. A little sweaty? Yeah. Oh, whatever. It happens. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. Go on. The show go must on. go on. Mm -hmm. Each dollar wisely invested in the best electric efficiency improvements displaces nearly seven times more carbon <coughs> emissions than a dollar foolishly wasted on nuclear power. For every $100 spent on subsidizing new nuclear capacity, about one ton of additional carbon emissions is released into our atmosphere, which could have been avoided if that money had been better spent instead on improved energy efficiency. Warning, we have a code red climate crisis. The International Energy Agency, IEA, warns us that we must stabilize and then begin to reduce our carbon emissions by 2017, only three years away. This nonsense about nuclear, about thorium the nuclear boondoggle only distracts the attention away from the here and now increased energy efficiency, combined heat and power, and appropriate renewable energy technologies, the three things currently available that can provide us with the most bang for our energy bucks when it comes to uh, climate mitigation. Dr. Mark Cooper, an economic uh, analyst with the Vermont Law Schools Institute for Energy and the Environment, 2009, quote, the additional cost of building 100 new nuclear reactors instead of pursuing a least cost efficiency renewable strategy would be in the range of 1.9 to 4.4 trillion dollars over the life of the reactors, unquote. Renewables are more than ready, and we don't even need thorium, the nuclear power boondoggle. According to a 2013 report by the International Energy Agency, global power generation from hydro, wind, solar, and other renewable sources will exceed that of natural gas and be twice as much as nuclear power by 2016. Renewables are expected to increase by 40% during the next five years and are now the fastest growing power generation sector. Renewables have become increasingly mainstream and thorium, the nuclear boondoggle, is nowhere to be seen. Nowhere. Nowhere to be seen commercially. According to a 2013 report, by the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, REN21 Network. 
worldwide investment in renewable power and fuels, not including larger hydropower projects, reached $244 billion in 2012. Uh, during that year, a whopping 45 gigawatts of new wind turbines came online, equivalent to 45 large 1 gigawatt, 1,000 megawatt nuclear reactors. Solar power added 30 gigawatts, equivalent to 30 large nuclear reactors, on par with larger hydropower, and has now surpassed the milestone of 100 gigawatts, equivalent to 100 large nuclear reactors. Re quote, renewables can reduce electricity prices considerably and thus alleviate energy costs for consumers, unquote. According to financial experts, these renewable energy technologies are, quote, coming to be seen as among the lowest risk investments. Throwing the nuclear boondoggle is pie in the sky. There's no commercial reactor built or running anywhere in the world. Now let's look at the 1,630 square foot zero energy idea house in Bellevue, Washington State. Just one example of real energy <coughs> pie on the table. Finished in 2009, Donna and Riley Shuri built what they consider to be the most green, most comfortable, most healthy, most and most well, most affordable, most healthy most comfortable, most green, and most quiet house possible. Quote, its sustainable credentials are many. Photovoltaic panels, solar hot water, tankless water heater, hydronic radiant heating, heat recovery ventilator, living roof, recycled content tile, salvaged wood flooring, metal roof, local materials, rainwood, rain water collection using a 3,000 gallon cistern, small footprint, wind turbine, five-star built, green rating, unquote. The kitchen features energy star appliances and light fixtures. For about 80% of the year, the, the Sherry home requires no outside energy for the utility to operate. Quote, in each year, Puget Sound Energy has sent the uh, Sherry's a check for about $650 for power return to the grid, unquote. The unresolved serious problems notwithstanding, Thorium the nuclear power boondog will simply is not necessary. We could use already available energy efficient, co-generation, and renewable energy technologies to make the complete shift to truly sustainable, carbon-free, nuclear-free energy systems that preserve our quality of life. A total transition to, renew to energy efficiency, co-generation, and renewable sources is likely to be less expensive to our lifestyles than many presume. A 2011 report by World Wildlife Fund International, ECOFUS, and the Office for uh, Metropolitan Architecture concluded that the world can meet all of its energy requirements for renewable resources by uh, 2050. This is at a cost that, quote, does not demand radical changes to the way we live, unquote. It would never surpass 2% of the global GDP. What's more, as money was put into expanding efficiency, cogeneration, solar, wind, and other truly sustainable energy choices, that would create tens of millions of green collar jobs. In turn, this would help to redistribute what has been an increasingly skewed income disparity, disparity in the West. That is largely a result of lower cost manufacturing in China and other developing nations. Here we come to another example of pro-nuclear mythology. The pro-nuclear technocrats have been dangling the pipe dream of cheap and virtually inexhaustible energy in front of us for a long time now, and the proponents of thorium the nuclear boondoggle are no different. Rather than being the panacea or cure-all for our problems, uh, the dangerous fantasy, or in other words nightmare, of cheap virtually unlimited energy would result in unparalleled planetary ecological destruction. Its production along with its direct and indirect use, would cause the over-exploitation, over-development of our entire planet. It is a public policy question of what should our energy priorities be. According to Columbia University economist Jeffrey Sachs in 2008, the smoothest possible worldwide transition to efficiency, co-generation, and renewables would likely require no more than 1% of the richer world income 
and less than that in the lower income countries. There is the expression, a new variation on the same old thing. This, that is exactly what came to mind the more and more I dwelt into this subject. A proposed commercial thorium-powered molten salt reactor is just another part of our energy problem, just another nuclear power boondoggle. Quote, thorium reactors can indeed be a nuclear weapons proliferation problem, unquote. Nuclear.com, December 12 of 2012. Writing in the British scientific journal Nature, Nuclear specialists from four British universities suggest that thorium should not be regarded as, quote, inherently proliferation resistant, unquote. Smaller amounts of uranium-233, a material usable in nuclear weapons, as we have seen, could be produced covertly from thorium by chemically separating out protactinium-233, another radionucleotide, during its uh, formation. This chemical protactinium-233 separation could possibly be done using standard laboratory equipment and potentially be done in secret beyond the oversight of the International Atomic Energy Agency. It is feasible that just 1.6 tons of thorium metal would be enough to produce 8 kilograms of uranium-233, the, the minimum amount required for a nuclear weapon. This smaller scale chemical reprocessing could be done in less than a year by potential willful proliferator states. According to Dr. Steve Ashley at the University of Cambridge's Department of Engineering and the paper's principal author, quote, the most important thing is to recognize that thorium is not a route to a nuclear future free from proliferation risks as some people seem to believe. The emergence of thorium technologies will bring problems as well as benefits. We need more debate on the associated risks if we want a safer nuclear future, unquote. Well, obviously, NEIS Nuclear Energy Information Service uh, disagrees with Dr. Ashley in that we want a nuclear-free future with no proliferation risks. There are no net benefits from thorium and nuclear power boondoggle. There's no such thing as a safer nuclear future, only a more inherent dangerous one. However, NEIS agrees that we should have more public discussion about the public policy issue uh, of the risks. Thank you, Matt. You ripped in the Timmy. Uh -huh. You ripped in the pretty hard, so that's good. Means I gotta do You got a lot of work to do. Of course they do. Yeah. Is it, what did he say, 14 billion years? That's, I am agreeing with him. It'll be safe in 14 no, that's, that's the years. formal presentation. I want to say a few more things just before the question and answer discussion session. Um, Last year I discussed oil and gas fracking and the Keystone XL pipeline and uh, tar sands. Uh, these are, you know, pun intended, hot topics that yeah. are in the news again. You had the people from Frack Free, Illinois. I unfortunately was unable to attend that college of complexes. You also had the uh, Midwest Tar Sands Free people, which I also missed. And I've worked on that stuff, so if there's any questions and discussions about that, that's fair game. There's also an under-the-radar issue I'll throw out. That's a proposed pebble mine for <coughs> Bristol Bay, Alaska. And I work on a lot of different stuff. And so if I haven't talked about it, uh, that doesn't mean I haven't necessarily worked on it. And so basically, you know, anything's fair game. And at this point, uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, let's start okay. the question and answer. All right, um, if All right. you don't... Let me just, let me just uh, remind everybody that uh, all questions, we're getting to the Q&A now, but all questions must end with a question mark. If you have a question, raise your hand. I'm going to start here, and I'm going to kind of work around. Okay, go ahead, Joe. Are you aware uh, that the, 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 the word salt in the thorium molten salt reactor is not table salt, but fluoride salt. Yes, I am. Reactors yes, I am. Elements in the <coughs> yeah, I am. Is that? I just want everybody to know. Yeah, it's correct. It's okay. fluoride. Yes, it is. All so right. What's the implication of that? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, you got it? Okay. okay what, what is the implication of that? He doesn't know. <laughs> that it's more reactive. 
No, it's not more reactive. It means they can yes. put the react. I'm sorry, go ahead, Dennis. My answer. Yeah. Well, yeah. The no, what it what it basically means is that the reactor right. doesn't need a large pressure vessel to work. It operates on a liquid deal, and at the bottom yeah. of a reactor is something called a freeze plug. And if there's a problem yeah, with the reactor, the liquid simply drains down into a into a drain tank. Yeah, no he doesn't problem. know. He doesn't know what no he's talking about. Okay, okay, listen. No, no, it, 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 it just drains out. I have some information. My apologies. It just drains out and you rub my tail. Just listen to what's being said. All right, all right. Everybody just be quiet. quiet. Yeah. That's one of the purported stated advantages of this stuff because I have those. I also have a lot of design challenges mm -hmm. that are unresolved and Tim is correct on that particular you know, point. But okay. again, the, the reactor is presumably right. not soundproof <laughs> and the physics and the chemistry seem to back that up but there are other safety problems involved with it. I mean light water reactors can explode like atomic bombs by themselves. The uranium fuel is much too dilute. I accept that as a scientific fact. But if you drop an atomic bomb on it, it will explode. And there is the problem of the meltdowns, which uh, at Fukushima, there were three of them. Okay, now, uh, all right. Now, I just want to just, I just want to say real quick that, uh, that, 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 that it's Dennis's job to answer the questions. Not, no, I don't not mind. Tim's. You're not right. Not I don't Tim's. mind clarification. Okay? I apologize. Okay. All right, now, uh, all right. Uh, all right, Neil, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, I have a two-part question. It is a request for information. I do not need emotional jerks like Boondoggle and Atom Bomb, and I do not need cherry-picked one-liners. My two-part question is, first, what is the difference between thorium and uranium? And second, what is the difference between the structure and the way it works of a uranium reactor and a thorium reactor? I could, I could, I could answer. Wait, wait, Tim, Tim, let, Tim, let, let, let Dennis answer. What's the difference? What you, you I explain that. I, I, I explain what is the that. difference between the two? I explain that it's you know fertile, not fissionable. That's the whole point of the, you know, that's the whole point. See. Well, what I mean, other what other qualities do um, they have? What's what? Just, well, supposedly just, they say that it's abundant. It's almost inexhaustible, but it's still a non-renewable energy resource. It's still well, what? What? How much? Wait, wait, is that? Neil, you got to let Dennis answer okay. too. <laughs> well, how much story I missed there? Um, I I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. I've got a lot. Of, I got like I got a lot of technical okay. information here. I can I can okay. help answer that. I can look it up and, and include that in the rebuttal. Or if Tim wants to okay. speak up, I don't really you know, All right. I don't what's, have any problems then, in doing that. Okay. What's the difference between the way a uranium okay. reactor works? And the way a thorium reactor All right. works. Wait, wait, let Tim, let, let Dennis, okay. Yeah, let Tim go okay. ahead. You want to let Tim answer? Yeah, let Tim. Okay, okay. okay. Dennis, ahead, it's, it's, I'm going to get up here for the sake of thing. A, a typical light water reactor runs with uranium U-235 or plutonium-239 bombarded by free neutrons in a centralized control rod processing core, usually made of zirconium. That explodes, sustains a chain reaction, and then it's used. In a thorium reactor, you still need a, a core of uranium-233, plutonium-239, and uranium-U-235 to start the reaction. It's in a liquid form, in a molten salt kind of form, and it's blanketed with thorium. Thorium-233 is blasted with free neutrons, decays to, I think, thorium-232 for about half an hour, and over a 28-day time period, eventually decays into uranium U-233, which is then used to refresh the fuels. Now, and it's a two-cycle deal. You have a blanket, you have a blanket of thorium and, and something like this, a core, and it's and it's usually piped in through a pressure vessel that we take out the fissionable waste products, the xenon gas, the other things that, that exist in here to keep the reaction going in a liquefied form. And then they have an, another liquefied form of thorium 233 two, I, I, I'm sorry, of thorium that that's our, surrounds the, the blank, blanket. So in essence, you have a reaction over a blanket of thorium. The thorium converts itself to uranium-233 
and the 233 is what produces the reaction. I that's all so theory. Here, that's that's all theoretical. theoretical. There's no they did it. They did it. They did it already. There's no reactor on Earth. Charlie, one bullet at a time. Yeah, that's all. Hey, Neil, one Neil yeah. that goes for you. That's too. boondoggle. I'm just, I'm just, all right, one bullet. One bullet. One bullet. One bullet. One bullet. Where's the thorium reactor? So, right? so they are completely hey, different Neil. structures. It's a completely with different completely type. Completely different yeah, failure modes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, they are. Then you left out. It's all theory. Oh. Okay. It could lead to your death. All right. All right. Um, Experiment with your all right. Chicago. Hey, hey, Charlie. Charlie. I, I just have some stuff here about thorium abundance. Yeah. These are supposed to again. These what the thorium advocates say are the advantages. <laughs> Okay. See, I'm not going to get into the supported advantages. You may say it's cherry picking, but we're an advocacy group, and I contend, and I'll be blunt with you, the thorium proponents are cherry picking their arguments yeah. using selective omission, and I see that as an experienced person in. Just, just let me, just let me talk. As somebody with a degree in science, I have public speaking and writing experience. I also have sales and, and fundraising experience. So I looked at this thing from the three, not just the science and technical, that's what you're doing. I'm also looking at it from the messaging and marketing standpoint. And that's why the first part of the presentation, for example. All right. Okay, All the right. Earth's crust contains you did about not three wait, wait. Neil, 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 you asked you ask hey, the question Neil. about the abundance, and I'm reading something ready from, you know, no, no. it's a... Next question. From, Next question. No, no, no. Okay. The Earth's uh, crust contains <laughs> as, about three times as much thorium as U-238, or 400 times as much U-235. Thorium is about as abundant as lead, and so on and so forth. You know, that's this, this, this All right. All right. there. All right. You want to know about the abundance, that's what it is, but that doesn't mean we should be digging it up and using it. Okay, Charlie, who's next? I got to wait for the chair. Okay, okay, okay Tanya. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to let it go this time, but when you have a question, you must please raise your hand. Okay, go ahead, Tanya. Where is the line in Excuse me? I don't understand the question. Where in the earth does it exist? In what layer of the crust does the thorium exist? I think that's what you said, Cassie. What layer of the crust? I don't know that. Um, uh, I would also I'm sorry. wonder what, uh, where on earth is this located? Okay. So what region of Earth? What area is of Earth? Yeah. On the west and southwest, just like where uranium is here in the United okay. States. China has uh, deposits. Chinese are doing research on this too. Other India. India too. India. India. Yeah, India also has deposits. India is also doing research and development on it right. too. Nice. All right. All right. Uh, all right, Charlie. Yeah, Dennis, I represent the federal employees in the Corps of Engineers who operate those locks and dams. You want to shut down the navigation on the Mississippi River so your little birdie friends can fly around? <laughs> No, we're not saying to say, I don't think that that's what it said. It said that you'll have, uh, you know, have the structures that are more friendly to wildlife and that won't cause flooding. I don't think there's anything that, I didn't say anything about shutting down any navigation. Those, that's not what the uh, National Wildlife Federation and Sierra Club are advocating. That's a good point, though. All right. Well, you don't have to shut down the navigation to do that. All right. Rob, did you have a question? <coughs> yes, I do. <coughs> I understand. It's a little off what you said, but I understand that uh, Mr. Tesla uh, somehow harnessed free energy and that it was used by the U.S. Army uh, to destroy the World Trade Towers. Ah! And uh, if okay. it's harnessable, uh, wouldn't this be a good alternate uh, for uh, <laughs> thorium reactors or, or any other energy yeah. source? Yeah, he's got you there, Dennis. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds like another conspiracy theory. <laughs> hey, 
Well, hey, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're All sorts of things. We've got to get, I know, I, I, we've got to really come down to earth. We've got some really serious issues to deal with. Climate disruption, um, oil over-dependence, a lot of different things that we really need to start thinking about really what we have now to use that has less environmental impact, but it also can you know, benefit our economy, benefit people's health, and we need to stop thinking about these so-called magical, you see them sometimes in some of the science and engineering magazines, the, I'm just, you know, just off the top of my head, I'm just like, you know, the energy XYZ stuff. We need to start coming down to earth and really making some real hard practical choices about what we need to do. We need to make a conscious effort you know, really to go, you know, carbon-free, nuclear-free is the, is the best bet that I've seen. Something that's technically infeasible and that we know it can be done. All right. You're, uh, wait, you're wait, saying wait. that it's a fantasy? That free energy harnessing is a fantasy? Or, or uh, it's you know, well, basically one of the laws of thermodynamics in ecology, there's no such thing as a free lunch. See. I mean, that's a law of this law of physics, and uh, very common, or again, adapted to that is a law of ecology as well. I mean, energy is not free. Um, you have to, there's consequences with any kind of, of energy, uh, you know, any, any kind of energy harnessing. All right, Frank. Yeah, I think that it's important when I mentioned that he didn't know what he was talking about because the issue was whether this, the molten salt is a reactive salt, which in case of a leak, it will catch fire. <clears throat> and if it's in contact with water, it will catch fire. Okay. Okay. It's, it's not table salt. All right. All right. That was the point. Okay. So Excuse the point was not only miss, but totally twisted into thinking about reaction or, or nuclear reaction. It okay. had nothing to do. It's the chemical composition of the salt. Right. Which it was an issue that was brought up. All right, that's a good point, Frank. But that would be something to bring up in the rebuttal speech. Yeah. Uh, not, not this, because this is a time for questions. questions. Okay, Mike, Mike Lehman. All right. You know, uh, it, it's pretty interesting and, and great that we have all these different uh, sources for uh, electricity. The Rundle's restaurant, the lights, the New York Chicago bullet train will run renewable. Uh, energy, electricity, uh, planes will not. I've been doing some research on oil and coal, and the United States is using less and less coal year over year. All right. Okay. Are you aware that the United States and the Koch brothers are now exporting coal at this level? Of course, we're using oil and jet fuel at this level and gasoline. So, we're reducing our use of coal here, but now it's all going overseas. So Absolutely, and I'm, all, oh, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm all over that as far as an issue, too. That's one of the uh, conundrums with the uh, um, Obama-Biden administration. They are coming out with, like, the carbon rule for uh, coal-fired power plants, which I testified for the U.S. EPA here in Chicago about, but then opening up the Powder River Basin, which is a public land, uh, U.S. Uh, Bureau of Land Management land in Wyoming and shipping the coal, you know, to, to China. For example, metallurgical coal can be used to make uh, iron and steel, and that's one of the things that, uh, that, that, that I, you know, that I've been opposing, yes, just like the, I'm, I'm opposed to the exportation of fracked natural gas. It's the same, you know, basic thing, that uh, these things are supposed to be for U.S. energy independence, but what happened? Uh, coal use is, as you say, well, activists have been uh, sorry, successful in, in, in canceling and stopping a lot of coal plants. But the, 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 the bad thing is that the, the things that the administration has been doing, and I do support, I do support the carbon rule for coal plants, I do support the increased fuel economy standards for cars and light trucks, I've uh, written and testified in support of all that, will be more than offset by wanting to dig this stuff out of the ground as you know, fast as we can and exporting it overseas. I agree with you that we should not be doing this and this stuff needs to be stopped immediately.
All right. Uh, Mike Foley, did you have a question? Yeah. You, you mentioned just a few minutes ago that uh, there are very serious sorry. issues facing sorry. us. Sorry. 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 God, I'm sorry. And you said we have to make I difficult decisions make about these issues, which I agree with. <coughs> Do you think the public gives a shit? <laughs> Do you think they give a shit enough that they will uh, make whatever sacrifices in terms of money? $8 or $10 gasoline and uh, electric bills and heating bills that are double what they are now? Do you think the public will go along with stuff like that? Because like, people say, well, who cares about a couple birds? Who cares about the bees? Who cares about a little radioactive pollution? Do you think the public will... I think the public is agreeable to addressing these issues when they realize what it's going to cost them in terms of lifestyle. Well, a lifestyle, I think, would be a better lifestyle. I mean, we would do a lot better job if we could get um, Fox News and the Koch brothers out of the way. But that's uh, a lot uh, easier said than done, uh, believe me. Um, I brought a book that my friend Andy Anderson has back there called Climate Capitalism. And it talks about how companies can increase their bottom line and save the planet at the same time. That's the kind of thinking that we do need, and that's why we need uh, that we have public education um, and, and things like that. But I, I agree with you that we have a uh, um, lot of the, I've read a book, a reality check. Uh, it's by uh, Donald Rothero, who's a paleontologist and a geobiologist. He talks about the sorry state of science education in this country, and particularly in terms of the acceptance, I don't say belief, in like in evolution, for example, or the uh, still, the uh, maybe the weather, will, the weather weirdness, and that's unfortunately what's, what's going to happen is that, the, you know, particularly this past winter with the uh, polar vortex, and everybody here in Chicago experienced and went through that. And that's just a taste of things that are, are going to come that it's going to, unfortunately, it's going to have to be hitting people in the face quite literally. Unfortunately, we're running out of time to do anything about it. That's why groups like NAIS are around. And that's why I do a lot of these action alerts from the national groups, from Sierra Club, Union of Concerned Scientists, National Wildlife Federation, so on and so forth. Uh, it seems like a big uh, hoe to uh, carry and to uh, put in the ground, but that, that's what, and why and things like this, the, the public discussions of the college of complexes um, are, are important, but I, I agree with you. The, um, all right, Ernie, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, regard kind of relates to, to maybe to Mike's question and some of the others. Uh, you, you threw out a number of 1%. I thought you meant by that, that is what our percentage of our GDPs or whatever we're going to put toward energy. Maybe I misunderstood. But in any case, what percentage do you know, what percentage of our GDP in this country and other countries do we spend on energy? Oh, I don't know that. I don't know that for sure. I'm trying to get what I was saying. I was talking about, again, in other words, climate mitigation Climate mitigation is not going to break the bank globally. That's the point of the discussion. And actually, when you're talking about uh, net savings, it's actually going to save us money. I was just finding in the fusion, I was just finding the part of the presentation. One percent and even less in, in poorer countries. And I didn't quite catch what that was. Making a transition to uh, sustainable, uh, non-nuclear, non-fossil fuel energy systems. Oh, okay. okay. 1% of the richer world income and less than that in lower income countries, according to uh, Columbia University economist Jeffrey Sachs. Oh, yeah. um, what period of time? Is it 1%? Basically, we're talking about probably is uh, by the year 2050. That's the, uh, it's been studied uh, by uh, independent analysis from uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, from Rocky okay. Mountain Institute. The study that I mentioned took more of a global flavor, okay. and both here in this country, Arjun Makajani from the uh, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research says 30 to 50 years to convert okay. this country. Other studies have said about the same thing. We're talking about a worldwide conversion by 2050. Okay, so that so one percent over that number of years until the conversion is so yeah. complete. Okay, thanks.
All right. If, I have a question. Over here. There's a uh, question oh, here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. Listen. Hi. Oh, yes. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. How credible are the um, are the films that have come from, I'm not sure what the name of the group is, but that's been documenting uh, primarily through videos the effects of the, uh, sand, the sandstone exploration in Alaska. You know what I mean? They say it's a very small community that lives in that area and an extremely high percentage of those people there have gotten all kinds of cancers, all kinds of tumors, that the fish in the area have been, <coughs> have been malformed, that a lot of the uh, vegetation is okay. destroyed. My question is, how credible is it? And if it's very credible, why haven't people taken more I'm not more familiar with the film. What area of Alaska was this uh, Keystone, is it? Keystone? Uh, sandstone? It's a pipe, oil pipe I think about the, the Indians, though. Oh, like that's okay. I know it's Keystone. Okay. Sandstone, Keystone, I'm not sure. The name. Keystone, the Indians are. All right, yeah. all right. All right, let's. Uh, John, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what, what are the long term effects on the eastern seaboard of the mountaintop removal? Now, I know that we're looking at major acute effects in West Virginia and the rest of Appalachia. But, I mean, you're talking about headwaters that affect, you know, how many tens of millions of people? What are we, what, has anyone <coughs> attempted to, to figure out what the, what the effects are of this? Or? I don't really know. That's a very, very good question. I mean, you're dumping the waste into, uh, you know, rivers and uh, streams and everything. Um, you're uh, destroying your wildlife habitat. You are reducing the toxic pollution. Uh, that's something interesting to look into to see if there have been any uh, studies uh, about the uh, the longer term um, effects and uh, not just environmental effects but health effects. They're there. I mean, there's no question, but that I'm not familiar about the specific studies and and the and how long the studies you know what the time period of the studies would be. That's a, that's a very good question. Okay, Carl, did you have a question? I Okay, uh, sir, did you have a question? Uh, I'll uh, review the uh, Obama's administration's response to these concerns and issues. It's, it's been a mixed bag. Um, a lot of the environmental groups that I get action alerts for are, you know, they're attempting to pat them on the back about these things, but wanting to do other things. Um, he needs to do a lot more of the right things. I mean, he was elected in 2008 by a landslide, and now uh, I mean, he's had to deal with a lot of different problems that uh, were handed to him. But now it's gotten to the point that he seems to be uh, caving in, and uh, no offense, becoming more and more of what I call a corporate Democrat. Uh, that's not to say that I don't support the guy. I'm just saying, in particular, uh, uh, Bill McKibben, and other writers have done a very good job a series in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, very good articles about exactly what we need to be keeping is most of these fossil fuels in the ground. And that um, I guess the, uh, the decision on Keystone XL has been delayed because the U.S. State Department wants other agencies to weigh in on it. This has been because of protesters surrounding the White House and people like myself, I've submitted multiple comments from the different action alerts about the various aspects saying that Keystone XL should be canceled, that it is a climate catastrophe and, and will result in more, in more climate chaos. So uh, unfortunately, as I said before, there are good things the administration has done that I've supported, but there are other things um, such as allowing um, you know, oil and gas fracking, opening up Powder River Basin to more coal exploitation, things like that. And of course, and particularly the wanting to export this stuff overseas, which is again something that uh, we, we should not be doing. All right. Tim, did you have a question? Yes. Dennis, I'm, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Dr. Laura a few <laughs> weeks ago. I like driving a car. I like crossing the Atlantic in less than eight hours on, an air, on a modern airplane. I like the fact that I can access the internet through an iPhone. All this takes power. You're against uh, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that's producing power now. What 
elaborate just a little bit more on how we're going to produce all this power, how we're going to develop the rest of the world, and how, just, just elaborate a little bit more on how, what you see is the fix to the problems. Okay, good question. Please, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very, we had and I'm K open. We NEIS, a strategy called carbon-free, nuclear-free. Dr. Arjun Makajani is an expert. He is a physicist and engineer. He's crunched the numbers and he's shown that it's technically and economically feasible to make a total transition to a 100% renewable energy economy within 30 to 50 years. Okay. He has outlined in his report, and this is something that you should take a look at. You should go on the website. I don't know if we have an NEIS, but IEER, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, you can. Um, you can, well, you can buy the book from okay. NEIS. I'm not here to sell okay. books. We do have it for sale. I don't have it here tonight, but you can get it for free on the website. And he, my basic point is that he outlines a 100% renewable energy grid. Okay. And I don't have the percentages no, no, that, that's memorized, fine. but it talks about the various things. You have solar, wind, okay. uh, you have biomass, you have combined heat and power. You have all the different things that, that, that add up to 100%. How do we get there? Well. We need a combination of policies. We have renewable energy portfolio standards that require electric utilities to ramp up their involvement with um, getting more and more electricity from renewable sources of energy. But as the book Ca Climate Capitalism talks about, that we need what are called feed-in tariffs. Uh, these, this has been successful in pushing, uh, driving uh, solar photovoltaic um, in, in Germany. Which, is a, which has cold, cloudy climate. It's not tropical. It's where you have uh, the utilities pay a fee to homeowners or any other what are called independent power producers. It could be a homeowner or a business and providing them with an, an equitable rate if they install uh, solar panels. There's also what's called net metering and that's something else that can be used to uh, promote wind power. And so that's just an example, plus removing of all the subsidies from fossil fuels and nuclear. But again, to do so is going to undercut all this, you know, all the, all the thorium stuff that you guys support. And that's, we just have a difference okay. of opinion on that. Um, so we need appropriate government policies combined with market-based incentives. Okay. What is the website again? IEER.org? Yeah, IEER.org. Okay. Yeah. You know, www.ieer.org. Look for carbon free, nuclear free. Uh, okay. I think a U.S. roadmap for energy strategy, or it's something like that. Okay, Carl, did you have a question? Uh, I'm going to try to ask it a different way. I know they're already transporting this uh, tar sand oil or whatever it is in railroad cars right through the center of our cities. So, which is safer? Should we continue not, to do it that way? Not or? safer. Yeah, and I work on that too. I'm, not, I'm just not giving you a bunch of crap. You're mentioning issues. Every single thing that you're talking about, and I said, bring it up. I worked on through Sierra Club and others that are saying, you know, to you know, stop the transportation of the oil in these cars because it, it as you said, it is dangerous. But we also especially need to stop your know, Keystone XL. But I'm in complete, I'm in complete agreement with that. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, we, are, we are faced with leadership that is absolutely insane. To have had Rachel Carson's book come out in the 1960s, and we are still where we are now. We have lost so much time. Are there any uh, representatives or senators that you know in Washington who really get how dangerous we, where the dangerousness of the situation we are in now, and who champion renewables at this point, or any brave enough to do that, are smart enough to do that, are care enough about the future of humanity. Ed Markey, is, Ed Markey has been good on uh, nuclear watchdog stuff. That name comes sure. up right, right, you know, Bernie right now. Bernie Sanders. Yeah, sure. Bernie Sanders also is an independent from Vermont. Yeah, he, I get, actually I get stuff from him too though. 
And he's yeah. also very good. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I Thanks for mentioning Bernie right. Sanders. All right. Now, is there anybody? I see that Charlie has his hand up and Mike Foley. Now, is okay. there anybody who has a question who has not already asked a question? Oh. Okay. Well, go ahead, Mike. Mm -hmm. I got a question similar to what that woman's question is. <coughs> you happen to know about the leadership of this country, the political leadership, commerce and industry leadership. Are any of these people so worried about these issues that they're leading by example and living Spartan lifestyles? <laughs> you happen to know. Well, I don't know about Spartan lifestyles, but I know that climate capitalism does mention uh, corporations. I mean, Richard Brand is not living a Spartan lifestyle, but uh, he's one of the ones that um, is in the forefront. I think he has the, the Carbon War Room, which is his nonprofit, which is directly addressing you know the climate crisis. I don't know about yeah, that's. I don't. Think, I'm, I'm. You know what kind of car the guy drives? Uh, no, actually, I don't. I don't. But I'm talking about how companies are now looking at you know solving our cri our climate crisis and that sustainability can improve their bottom lines. I don't know they're not living Spartan lifestyles, but um, they're, but they're they're making they're making money by saving the planet. So I, I just like to say it's like planet, people, and profits. There's there's you know planet over profits, and there's like uh, there's a definition of sustainability that I've seen from the US EPA that goes along those lines. No, so that's what we had a couple of years ago. Uh, Planet Over Profits was the main banner uh, for the NATO protests that I actually helped organize a couple of years ago. And that's true up to a point, but I think that, you know, yeah, that climate capitalism, you know, says that, you know, that, you know, you, you can actually can do okay. both. I, I have a question. Um, you talk a lot about climate capitalism. Do you, do you consider capitalism responsible for, uh, for the uh, destruction and damage to the environment? <laughs> No, I consider uh, basic factors as aligned by uh, Paul Ehrlich, uh, Ann Ehrlich, and John Holdren. I equals PAT. Impact on the environment equals the uh, th th three factors: uh, population, affluence, and technology. Uh, you have over. You have the. You have the over. You have the population growth that was talked about earlier in the first part. You have affluence, which is overconsumption. And it can be in a capitalistic economy or a socialistic economy. Okay. Uh, All right. And as a growth All maniac right. economy right. in, in a finite space is basically What's possible, heard? regardless of the basic economic system. No, and I'm of not course, the technology, uh, nuclear yes, power, I think, is the best example of the. Uh, of, uh, I think, no offense, uh, Tim, that's where your fraud is. You say renewable energy is a fraud. To me, nuclear power is, to me, uh, you know, no, no, I know that Dwight Eisenhower in his farewell address warned us about the uh, influence of the military-industrial complex. But growing up, to be honest with you, my view is that it's just as, if not more dangerous, is the nuclear-industrial complex. I think it's, it's you know, there may be some safety-minded people in. I think it's totally corrupt. And uh, simply, I think that's that's where the, that's where the fraud is, and that's the best example of basically a failed technology. Um, but that's what I consider it to be, and of course you've got the attitudes and assumptions that go along in, in supporting you know in supporting all this stuff. Well, I'd like to ask a brief follow-up question. Okay. Now, um, a little louder, at, Don. You weren't little. at the you weren't at the Earth Day summit this week, but I have been told that it was kind of a uh, what shall we say? It was kind of a it was it was a, it was kind of a fusion of, of red and green politics. Have yes. you heard about that? Oh, I oh I know I yeah, know more yeah, than yeah. just that. I was involved a couple of years ago in helping to organize the NATO the NATO protests with uh -huh. these people, and I happened to check online and saw one of the anti-capitalistic signs that, that that had been posted. So I, I know yeah. Okay. Uh, I know more. I'm well okay. aware of what, of what, of the, and that's their opinion. And I express my opinion. Actually, I said exactly what I said here. Okay. It's uh, you know, it's overconsumption regardless of the economic system. And they said, well, that could be a part of one of the discussion groups and everything. And when I was uh, or, uh, helping to organize a couple of years ago, you know, and I, I made that uh, made that very clear. Uh, okay. So yeah. then you would agree that. So, so, so you would agree then that a, a, a communist country such as the Soviet Union or China with its okay. over okay. power right. is Six just capable of, yes. uh, of, of environmental damage. Yes. 
as, as a, a wicked capital of a country like the United States. Sure. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, all right. Now. Um, Let's get the rebuttals. Yeah, well, let me just, there's a few more questions. We've got a little bit of time, Tim. Okay, just, okay. Uh, all right, I see that Charlie had his hand up. Oh, I see Neil's no, got his hand up. I'm going to go to Charlie next. We can get the rebuttals, but... Okay, okay, yeah. I'll skip Charlie. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, this is my first question, probably the last one. Um, are you aware uh, that there uh, are two basic, uh, and what do you think, what do you think of the two basic... Uh, categories of uh, the climate scientists, you know, their opinion of where we are. Like one group says, we've already passed the tipping point, the earth is going to warm up 10 degrees and it's over, there's nothing we can do. The other group says, we have a choice if we move in a massive direction, like what you're talking about, and get off fossil fuel, start now, Manhattan Project, like putting a man on the moon, we have a chance. Uh, what do you think uh, of those two you know, uh, different uh, uh, evaluations of where, how, how critical the climate crisis is and how much time we have to get moving to solve it. That's why I'm, I'm asking you, what, what is a nice thing uh, about, on this subject? The, the, latter, the latter group of scientists that say <laughs> that, uh, again, we, we have to take drastic measures to get off of fossil fuels. You know, the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change basically favor renewables over nuclear power to do that. So again, you have to be a realist, but I'm a perpetual optimist that my bets would go with the latter group of scientists that you, that you mentioned. All right. Um, all right, Mike Lehman, go ahead. Um, you a question? Just a quick, quick comment. Uh, well, not, this isn't time no, for comments, but you can do that in rebuttal. All right. No, okay, here, go, go ahead, Neil. I had a question. When is the last Too time late. you had a major change of mind on, on one of these topics? What do you mean, major change of mind? You changed your opinion, you discovered information that, that made you see things differently, you changed your position, like that. Well, growing up, I'm going to go back a ways, in the 1960s that I was a had the wonderful world of tomorrow in Boyce Life magazine, and I accepted <laughs> nuclear power back then because that was the only thing that you know, was preferred energy source. We could have, this is more of your hype, we could have an atomic powered car. There was a depiction in Boyce Life magazine because wow. I went through scouts. Cool. Of, uh, uh, atomic, it looked like a large SUV. <laughs> you could drop a pellet of nuclear fuel in and it would run for a year. Yeah. No mention about the radiation or waste. That was, was my question. Biggest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you believe that you haven't changed your mind in 50 years? I'm answering the question. Neil, this is not a time to disrupt. If you want to disrupt, I'm not going to change strictly about nuclear power. Okay. 40 years. And basically, it's remained the same since. For 40 years? All right, let's yeah, maybe right. go to Everything's the rebuttal. Yeah. In opposition let's to go to the rebuttals. I'm not okay. one of these so called environmentalists. Well, I'm an environmentalist and I support nuclear power, not me. No way. All right, all right. now. No way. All right, all right, folks. Now let's. Um, I'm just going to tell you what we what we're going to do here. Now these these four are the on deck chairs. So you just line up. Come through here. Do we want to move the podium over for the rebuttals? Um, actually, do why don't we get? Why don't you move the tables over this way? I can't. Um, what all the tables? No, they, they. No, just these these whatever tables are here. Just move them this way. Well, that's all. Uh, yeah, we can do that. No, I don't want to. I want to leave that enough alone. I tried moving the tables while y'all were talking, and 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 and, and oh. I messed it up. And I don't want to mess it up worse. Just give <laughs> people the microphone. Then. Okay. So so I realize I realize that a lot of people might be too big to get through there. Just have them come up in the middle and handle the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Stand in the middle. So I'll tell you what. All right. First of all, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> yeah. Nice job, guys. Yeah, yeah. All right, look, if you, can't, if you can't get through this way, just go through the other way. Now, let's just have let's just have a quick show of hands, everybody. How many people want to give a rebuttal speech? Everybody, uh, everybody who wants to give a rebuttal speech, raise their hand. Everybody in the room. Okay, okay, all right. One, two, three. Keep those hands up. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, Richard, <laughs> 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, hey, one full of a time, Richard. 
All right. All right. All right. I call. I, I'm going to call on Richard to be the involuntary first rebutter. Uh, four minutes apiece. Uh, Twenty minutes each. No. No. no about four minutes each. No. Four minutes each. I got. Okay. I got a timing on, device okay. here. Uh, Richard, you wanted to talk. Come on. Come up. Come to the microphone. I didn't give you one. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. You're up first, Mike. Come on up. Oh boy, Mike. Oh, okay. Okay. Hey, hey, Frank. Did you do this all by yourself? Okay. What a guy. Are you ready? Hello. Ready? Okay. My question was why are you opposed to uh, natural gas exports? I know it's illegal to export them. Crude oil from the United States. That's wrong. That was my question. <coughs> Good. Uh, so you. Anyway, um, I think the Keystone Pipeline thing is that issue because the railroads are shipping a lot of fracking oil and a lot of tar sands and a lot of uh, uh, all that crap. <laughs> Going through your town. Lately. So you, if you see these two mile long tanker car trains coming through your town, that's all the uh, that's all the stuff that would have went through the Keystone. So the Keystone horse is left the barn. So you could fight that if you want. Anyway, um, on the railroads, there's keep in mind there's still four railroads on the Monopoly board. If you ever played Monopoly, they're making tons of money on that that uh, that oil. Um, I, uh, I'm not real happy with generally with the green people's attitude when they say uh, carbon free, it's got to be carbon free, it's got to be no oil, no gas. Or gas only, no oil, no, no coal. I mean, a bullet train's not going to go over the ocean. So we need an airplane, Tim, to get over to Europe, of course. So I think this all or nothing approach, it's got to be a mix. You know, in economics, you always want to diversify. You can't get entirely rid of coal or nuclear or nuclear or green or wind or solar. It's all got to be a mix. So I'm not in a complete agreement with uh, carbon free. Um, one thing I am in agreement about, and I think most people, I think most Americans are pretty rational people, and I would think that they, if we if we burn less oil, it's a good thing. I think most people would think that if we burn less oil, use less oil, it's a good thing. I think most people would think that. So, I don't trust oil companies. Maybe everybody here does. <laughs> Remember we went into Iraq and spent trillions of dollars and guys had their private parts blown off and everything else. Could, because Dick and Mr. Bush thought that was a good idea. Well, we thought oil wood prices would go down and gasoline prices would go down. And now with this fracking and tar sands and tar shale and all this crap, prices, oil companies are not going to have prices go down, are they? Now, so I would not trust oil companies at all, anymore, at all. And the less we use of oil, other, other things we can do, whether it's electric bullet trains or anything else, I think the better. Um, last thing I think I have here is, um, I think if one of the issues that begs to be uh, brought up is carrying capacity of the world. And we're at seven trillion or seven billion people now. And I think resources are going to get stretched even more and more. And, you know, our environment's going to get stretched more and more, and uh, I think the day's going to come where, uh, you know, with usable land and usable air and usable resources are going to become an issue. So I think it's a, a good idea we start looking at, you know, what, what the Earth can, can handle for 7 billion inhabitants. Thanks. I'm Michael Foley. I'm glad I was here tonight. I've heard Dennis Nelson's lecture in the past. Actually, Dennis Nelson and I have had harsh words in the past. I've got nothing bad to say about him tonight. I agree with a lot of what he said. The stuff about destruction of wildlife habitat, I think that's a very important issue. You really 
is an indication that the human race is destroying the world that we live in. Sort of a general, mac general macro type of a, a, a point. There aren't any facts and figures, but it seems like to me, if the wild animals in this world don't have any place to live anymore, it's because we're the ones that are destroying the place where they used to live. Now, I asked about what he thinks about the leadership of this country, the political leadership and the commercial industrial leadership of the country. I'll tell you what I think about them. They don't care nothing about this. They're all living profligate lifestyles, they're all living wasteful lifestyles, they're flying around in private jets and riding around in limousines, and if anybody says anything to them about it, they come up with some BS line about, oh, I'm so important, my time is so valuable, I have to be able to go where I want when I want, and I'm doing a greater good by what I'm doing than the harm I'm doing by the energy I waste. They all got that BS line about they're doing a greater good. I can't stop and end it now without taking a shot at that, that piece of garbage, Al Gore. <laughs> <laughs> Al Gore is a despicable creature. <laughs> Al Gore has spent at least 10 years going all over the world saying that there is no such thing as man-made global warming. No, I'm going to repeat that. You got it backwards. No, I don't. That's why I'm going to repeat it. Al Gore has spent at least 10 years going all over the world saying there is no such thing as man made global warming. That's because Al Gore flies around in private jets, he rides around in a convoy of SUVs and limousines. Oh, you're trying he to eats kill tons and tons of food, <laughs> yeah. and his lifestyle shows that he believes that when he's given these lectures about global warming, he believes that every word coming out of his mouth is a lie, because he lives the exact opposite of what he talks. And Al Gore says, you can burn a billion tons of high sulfur coal, you can burn a billion barrels of high sulfur oil. It doesn't increase global warming, doesn't melt the ice, doesn't hurt the polar bears, doesn't pollute the earth, doesn't do this, doesn't do that. As long as you pay off. You give some guy, he's got some friend. Al Gore says he gives the guy money, and the guy gives him a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper it says carbon credits. <laughs> and when you pay off and you get that piece of paper it says carbon credits, no matter what you do is not harmful, to the world, to the environment, no matter how much high sulfur coal you burn, no matter how much oil you burn, it does not pollute, does not do any bad thing. As long as you pay off and get that piece of paper that says carbon credits. Al Gore shouldn't weigh 100, 400 pounds because he's got bullshit coming out of his mouth day and night. <laughs> Al Gore is the biggest liar on the planet Earth. Al Gore is a despicable creature. He says, all these things that we worry about that are very real issues, destruction of wildlife habitat, air pollution, I imagine Frank is going to probably get up here, talk about how we're polluting the Pacific Ocean, which we are. Al Gore says, no matter what you do, it's okay, it won't hurt any of that stuff. As long as you give his friend some money and you get this crummy piece of paper to carbon credits. You give me money, I'll go there too. There you go. Oh, boy. Give me money. I thought the selling of indulgences was outlawed with the Pope. Shh. I'll take ten bucks for my opinions. <laughs> if you take the word nuclear and reverse the first two letters, it becomes unclear. And I think that's what we're experiencing tonight. But I must say that I attended about a month and a half ago a conference that was called Law and the Environment. Uh, most of the people there were lawyers and there were two uh, environmentalists. But uh, the featured speaker was the head of the battery investigation unit at Argonne Laboratory. And he talked about developing uh, new types of batteries that would uh, be, be lighter and would also prevent um, 
the huge power expenditure needed to move batteries around. And they would be used for both industrial, commercial, residential use. Um, one of the environmentalists asked him the question, how will you charge the batteries? He said, that's not a problem. We'll use nuclear energy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go next, Don. Okay, go ahead, Tim. I, too, am for saving the planet. I, too, am for ending this environmental degradation. I, too, am for lessening the population. I just have a different way of doing it. Uh -oh. Population <laughs> will go down when affluence goes up. According to the CIA World Factbook, once you start making about $8,000 GNP per year per kid, I mean per, per person in the country, and you give them a good source of energy, kids become no longer a source of labor but an expense. And let's put it to you this way, kids today are expensive. It takes about a quarter million dollars to raise one, and then of course they don't have to leave at 18. So maybe uh, one or two kids, not three or four. And that's how the population is going to go down around the world as we develop. I think we'll see it, and it's been a part of the trend uh, from a book called the next 100 years, as far as energy consumption is concerned, I too support renewables. I too support some of the innovations in battery power and battery thing, but it's simply not going to be enough power to cover it. You take a look at a modern day data center, for example. It might use half the output of a current dam on a hydroelectric project. Certain data centers that Facebook have right now are using almost half the amount of wind energy in Idaho at this point. And plus, every one of them, whether you have a wind turbine or a solar power, has fluctuations in it. And what does that mean? Natural gas generation. And it's been proven in a few studies that you actually burn more natural gas by varying the amount of power that the generator produces than you would if you just had a straight natural gas plant. <coughs> now, why am I for this uh, new type of thorium-powered nuclear reactor? Because it's a little safer, it's a little cheaper, it's been done already. The very guy who invented the light water reactor, Alvin Weinberg, who was also the director of Hope Ridge, was actually fired in 1973 by the Nixon administration decrying the light water reactor, calling it a Faustian bargain. And a, a re, a, these liquid type of reactors have been ran successfully at Oak Ridge for over 6,000 hours in the early 1960s. It's not like we haven't done this before. Here's the clincher, though, as to why the U.S. should really pursue this thorium thing, this thorium nuclear power, because China is doing it right now. They have over 300 people headed by the, form, the son of the former premier of China last year, and they're going to develop this reactor, and they're going to make it cheap enough that people will buy it worldwide. We actually did the research. We actually did the intellectual property on it, and it would be a shame to have it now taken away from us by the Chinese. We own enough. Now, as far as thorium, profit, plenty, plentiful, and whatever, thorium is found a lot in what they call the rare earth actinides. How many of you have headphones for your iPhones or your iPads or whatever? There's a little element in there called neomidium that's plentiful with thorium. And as you mine <coughs> rare earths, you're going to find that th thorium is a byproduct. But anyway, my time is up. I have a whole different viewpoint than Dennis does, but I do appreciate the fact 
that he's taken the time to do the research, that he's taken the time to take care of things. And Dennis, nice job in, in getting something together, okay? All right. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, there was a, a citywide, actually, was it worldwide or nationwide? You mentioned it. People are aware the, the Earth Day activities this year were called Global Convergence. And if I'm correct, we were the first event to, to register in the Chicago Metropolitan. So this is an event of the Global Convergence. Uh, I just want to thank Dennis for two respects his speaking again this year and for his continued efforts during the year uh, for the benefit of the ecology and the sustenance of uh, animals, plants, and humans of the earth. So let's thank him again. I'll be very brief. I'm obviously a greedy, but um, in response to the gentleman who just spoke, <laughs> uh, you may have missed one key phrase. Uh, he, it's a type of technology that he would like to develop. Well, in psychology, there's a thing called one trial learning. <laughs> And what is one trial learning? I can summarize it for you very simply. One needs only to, to touch the hot stove once to not do it again. And it is instantaneous learning. No repetitive trial and error. You learn it very well. Uh, thorium reactors do not exist. Uh, they are being researched. Uh, you're thrown at, well, these guys are doing it, so we better raise some sort of race, technological race against people in another country. Uh, it is unproven technology. Uh, it will be at least 10 years before there's a workable uh, device of this type. Now, the only thing that comes to mind with this is, are there any risk attendant to this? You know, technology sometimes can, you know, be hazardous. Now, you tossed around the figure that somewhat lodged itself in my mind, is that if you make a mistake with this technology, you have 14 billion years in order to correct it. <laughs> <laughs> now this is your choice that uh, yeah, you're presenting to us. <laughs> that in the event we perhaps aren't too good at what we're doing, you know, simply wait 14 million years and we can do it all over again. All right, that's all I got to say about this. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, boy, I'll say, come to the college in 14 million years from now. Based, yeah, and if you hold a piece of thorium in your hand with a 14 billion year half life, it's safe. Our Still queen, idiots there too. who pointed out that a cat that steps on a hot stove will never step on a hot stove again, and also never step on a cold stove. Um, I, personally, I think that someone who has been studying for 40 years and never found anything that changed their mind in any significant way is not doing a very good job of studying. Uh, a little to my surprise, our, our cameraman here made almost exactly the two points that I came up here to make, so I will, we're paraphrasing each other. People who feel materially secure don't have lots of children. This is a physical fact which our entire world demonstrates. The rich countries have crashing birth rates. Interesting, the country with the lowest birth rate in Europe is Italy. So that they, I, I, the Pope's influence apparently has some limits. Um, and that is producing the, the negative population growth, which can only be compensated for by immigration, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth through all the stuff that we read in the papers or, or hear on the news. So if we can make everyone comfortable, 
the population problem is solved in the next generation. And the leverage point there is the girls. First, give women health care and contraception, and then give the girls an education. And although that sounds oblique and perhaps paradoxical, that is the known, proven cure for overpopulation. Secondly, I think it's interesting that almost the only hard number that our, our guest quoted was he said it would be a 30 to 50 year transition away from our fossil fuel carbon economy. It seems to me that the one certainty about our energy future in the next generation is that it will become more diverse. We will be using energy from more different sources. We will be storing it and shipping it in more different ways. High density liquid is a fabulously convenient way of, of handling energy, but uh, we can't keep using as much gasoline and diesel fuel as we are. We have to get through that transition. And to the best of my knowledge, the arithmetic says part of that will be nuclear. Uh, I like what I've heard about thorium. I haven't gone into it in super detail, but I know that it is radically, completely different from a uranium reactor. So somebody who just says radioactivity is blowing smoke. We're talking about two quite different things. There are some similar problems and dangers, but mostly not. Um. However, we have to get through the transition. We will, one way or another. The worst case scenario is we produce a 10-foot rise in the oceans, lose half our cities, and we have a collapse of technological civilization. And boy, will that cut our, our species <laughs> energy consumption. But I'd rather not go that route. To get through the transition, the arithmetic says we're probably stuck with nuclear. And one of my absolute favorite hippie futurologists, Stuart Brand, said when he changed his mind, I'm not pro-nuclear. I'm pro-arithmetic. <laughs> we just have to overcome our, we just have to overcome our childlike fears of, well, of Chernobyl. Uh, I'd like to thank Dennis for a good talk. As always, very thoroughly researched. A lot of detail, uh, a lot of numbers, which I like. Although I was happy to hear Dennis admit uh, that he's an advocate, and as such, he is entitled to cherry pick uh, what he presents. Not to lie, but to, uh, but certainly to present the, the facts that are more in, uh, aligned with his view, uh, and that's good. I wish uh, more of the advocates here would do that. However, what I'd like to see, which would help us the most, would perhaps be a debate sometime in the future. We have Dennis here, we have somebody from the Thorium, Thorium Alliance here, and somebody from Comet, perhaps, and they can interact and, and uh, uh, you know, they can kind of control each other's uh, omissions, so to speak. <laughs> okay, that would, uh, that would, be, that would be interesting. Uh, I was also glad to hear Dennis talk about population reduction as one of the major solutions to our energy problem. Uh, it's not only a solution, I think it is the main solution and the critical solution. Uh, it's not only a solution to the energy problem, it's a solution to a lot of problems which we may have, which would be food and any of the other uh, shortages we have and any of the, uh, a lot of the conflicts that we have around the world would be reduced, if not eliminated, if we had a smaller pop population. Not all of them, of course, but some of them would be. Uh, authorities that I have heard uh, and have uh, written books on the subject, some of them say that the ideal population is one billion people. We're up to between six and seven billion now. The, worth, the Earth can only support about a billion people at Western lifestyles. Frank has often brought up the issue of four Earths. We need four Earths to support the current population we have. Those numbers come out actually uh, very, very uh, similar. Uh, it's Politically speaking, it's very, very difficult. We would have to somehow uh, control births. Uh, 
and people consider having babies as just a, a sacred, automatic, assumed right. And as long as that is the case, we're going to have a problem with this. Now, Paul Ehrlich uh, did point out, a lot of people will say, well, uh, you know, the, the birth rates are going down in advanced countries. Well, that's good. Uh, it's particularly good because Paul Ehrlich pointed out years and years ago that babies born in the industrialized world, in wealthy countries, will use many, many times the resources, including the non-renewable resources, that babies, uh, you know, of the very, very poor will use. So population control, probably, probably the most important way to go. Thank you very much. Wants to give a we got more people wanting to come. Come on up. Okay. Give it to John. Yeah. Okay, both. Margaret, go first. She's up first, oh. and you can go second. Go right ahead, Margaret. I'm going to be very short. I know. I'm sorry about that, Margaret, but yes, I, I, I'm, I, I can't. I can't move the tables without risking them all falling over. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just a second. Of course, you might crash it right down. Actually, there are three. Um, Factors that are uh, uh, are identified, regardless of income levels in countries for reduced birth rates. You pointed out two, which is availability of um, birth control and actually health care for women. Um, this, the second is women's education. When women are educated, the birth rates go down. And the third is that people feel that that their children will survive. A lot of places have, I mean, if you look back in history, you know, people had 13 kids and maybe three survived into adulthood. So when you uh, are more assured of the survivability of your children, you're probably going to have fewer to begin with. Um, I comment that from an issue more of women's rights than population control, but certainly population control is part of that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, is that um, in terms of changing your mind about something. You know, when I was a kid, my mother told me not to get out in front of cars that are coming down the street. I have not changed my mind about that, and that's been 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I can. Okay. Two objects cannot occupy the same You guys, you guys are all afraid of change. That's all it is. A little change. It's a fact here at the college too. Okay. A little change, and you're ready. Scared. Um, I would like to thank uh, both our speaker and our hosts. Um, and. This has been um, just as much fun as I anticipated it being. I'm a first time here. So. Good. But uh, um, <laughs> I'd like to, to sort of um, dovetail on what's already been said about the impact of Western uh, populations being, I've heard the number being four times as large as third world populations. We have absolutely no right to dictate to third world countries what they should be doing, raise their populations without seriously controlling our own. We have more or less a 1.2 billion people in, 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 in terms of impact in this country. and. What we need to do, and we're bucking the trend, incidentally. You say, oh, if material wealth increases, the population growth is going to decrease. Well, we and Iceland, and Iceland can't hardly be faulted for trying to increase its population, uh, buck that trend. And what are we going to do about it? Well, I don't know. Um, I personally am an advocate of forced sterilization. I know that that's a horrible thing to say in this country now. It's, But, you know, we did it for about 100 years, and... Um, it did, to a, a, a great degree, curb the reproduction of people with genetically inferior traits. We should be doing that because it costs... I happen to be... Look, I will sterilize myself when the time arrives for me to... For the, I'll ship in. Exactly. All right. Hey, you're pay for it? Cool. I mean, you'll pay for it regardless anyway. So I'm not care. Oh, no. Okay. Bird, we'll do it for free. All right. <laughs> I mean, look, but look, but my, my point is this, you, we should, if, if, if we want
want to lessen our impact, we need to do it through brute force because we have no time left. We can't wait generations for people to, for education to increase. We can't wait. We, we have, global warming is already seriously impacting our lives and it's going to impact our lives worse in the future. What are we going to do about it? You know, either we can have, I, 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 think, for, I think a carrot and stick approach is essential. What we should say is look, if you don't want to have a kid, we'll pay you, we'll pay you more in, in terms of, of, of welfare than the poor are receiving now, we'll give you much better government subsidized housing, we'll, we'll, we'll subsidize your food, blah, 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 blah. But if you have a kid, we won't pay you anything. You're cut off completely. And you only have to cut off a few people in order for it to work. You just have to cut, them, cut off a few people and then they'd have to tell everyone else in their communities not to have kids and you know, you'll be better off materially. And I think that there's, that we have to do something and that, that would probably be an effective, uh, an, an effective approach. And it's like, oh, well, you know, oh, you don't have to take birth control. You just, if you don't want the money, you don't have to take the birth control. You know, it seems very, pretty, pretty, pretty simple to me, but you know. And to say that, oh, well, you know, yeah. To, to, to say that eugenics is an inherent evil, is to say that a hundred years of American history are completely irrelevant. To say that, that, the develop, that, that, that the progressive movement of the early 20th century is completely irrelevant. To say, you know, j j oh, just because it was taken to an, an unfortunate extreme in Nazi Germany doesn't mean that less severe forms of eugenics aren't viable. So, you know, I just wanted yeah, to try one. <laughs> Time. <laughs> to point that out, so, okay. you know. Okay. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Ted, are you pro-thorium or again it? <laughs> Probably not pro-thorium. Uh, well, those of you who have heard me speak before, and I've spoken this several times before, uh, will probably recognize that uh, I'm kind of a broken record. Um, I'd like to ask, how many people here were given a million dollars to express their opinion that they expressed today? How about two million? You were given two million dollars? One. Okay. <laughs> um, we have rational discussions here based on facts. We have disagreements, but they're honest disagreements based on what we know or what we think about reality about the facts. Mm -hmm. The problem that we have with um, our environmental policies, our energy policies, uh, the fact that uh, they're all screwed up and we're going to hell in a handbasket within a, a decade or two in this country and, and in the world. The problem is that uh, the people that make the decisions about all these things are being given millions of dollars by their benefactors, by billionaires, by huge corporations, People like Rahm Emanuel, President Obama, half the people in Congress are, are, are millionaires. The others are, are, are given millions. Okay. So um, I'll just uh, say once more that uh, if we're going to change the direction of this country on environmental policy, on military policy, on economic policy, on any given policy that you care to bring up, we have to change our form of government. We have to get this kind of forum to be the, the form of government, where people discuss things, ordinary people, not uh, beholden to billionaires, and they make the decisions. Right now, we have a, a, a completely dysfunctional and uh, not workable form of government. These representatives, quote-unquote representatives of ours, they don't represent us. When are we going to wake up to that fact? Only a handful, like Bernie Sanders, there are a few, okay? They're good folks, but they're always a minority. The vast majority are venal people, power-seeking people, ambitious uh -huh. people. That's why they become politicians. I agree with you with most of what you say about politicians. Thank you, sir. Um, so we have to change this form of government and get a, an actual democracy. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be fucked. <laughs> We uh, still have an open mic. All right, all right, all right. Who else would like to give? Go ahead. Sir. Come on up. Well, somebody's not afraid of technology. Yeah. Oh, good. I guess yeah. that's me. Good. <laughs> I am. 
have to come over. Dad, would you like to dessert? Thank you. We're okay. My name is Stan Barkus. My field of study is applied sciences. Jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. But chemistry and physics are biggies for me, always have been since the 60s. It's nice to mention Rachel Carlson, but the problem there, Car yeah, uh, the problem there was a manufactured product. Whether you're talking about dioxin or DDT, the issues here tonight, the biggies, lead, thorium, uranium-238, they're all naturally occurring processes. They're all naturally occurring. They're not chemically manufactured combinations like tetramethylid. That was a very manufactured thing. We got, got rid of it nicely. But the big three tonight, the thorium, the lead, uranium-238, whether we make a reactor or not, they're still in the ground. We're not going to manufacture it, even an ounce of it. Whether you use it in a reactor or not, it's still going to be there. And none of them are aerosol dispersed. The thorium's okay. It's not <laughs> Yeah, just, yeah, you guys are got childlike peers. Good evening, I'm Larry. I uh, want to first support uh, our tonight speaker, uh, Dennis Nelson. And uh, I, I thank you for actually uh, <coughs> bringing in the concept of uh, population control. Uh, that's going to be uh, the, the, uh, the ultimate problem as to uh, all the other problems. Uh, so with the uh, uh, finding a source of energy, it's, uh, it, it comes down to just too many of us. And uh, it, it, it continues to be a problem. It was a problem a decade ago, and it, it just it, it's getting exponentially that way. And <coughs> what I want to address with the uh, energy is that uh, with any energy source, there, there's a downside. But at least with uh, wind and solar and the geothermal, you don't have the, the possibility of radiation, and I consider that the, the ultimate toxic that uh, you have uh, is a problem with thorium, uh, uranium, uh, with its uh, uh, nuclear energy. And, and when you talk about the natural resource of uranium in the ground and, and lead, it, it is natural occurring, but at least it's safe when it's in the ground uh, before it gets dug up. It's, it's nice and safe. And, uh, the idea is to leave it in the ground, not, not that the minute you start disturbing the earth and the, the, uh, uh, causing the, uh, those elements to become airborne, that, that's, that's where the, the problem uh, starts. Um, I, I want to address the idea of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, it used to be called global warming, but as you can see from the past winter, it, it's not just a, a case of the planet warming up, it it's also can be cooling. Uh, so the idea is what, whatever weather was happening in various parts of the world, it, it's changed. Uh, 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 the northern hemisphere is getting warmer. Uh, the weather is moving from Florida to Illinois, and it's getting warmer as it goes north uh, compared to historically how it was. Uh, and historically, it would be like 50 years ago and before. Um, that there's massive flooding and, and droughts happening. There's these intense we weather patterns that are taking place. Uh, there's microbursts of uh, rainstorms. There's these intense snowstorms that are taking place. Uh, and uh, I'll just finish by saying, with uh, radiation, uh, if, if you're so fixated on the idea of uh, uh, uranium and thorium to power your energy source, uh, I would say that you're going to need to donate a lot more money to the American Cancer Society as a result. <laughs> okay. Oh, a childlike fears. How do I stop learning to love the Okay, book? hi. My name is Ellen, and I just wanted to say a few things. Um, first of all, 
there seems to be a real problem. I think some of you have brought that up with, you know, the timetable at which things are being done. Um, I just watched this movie about a week ago called Mike's Beautiful World. And it did talk a lot about peak oil. I'm not sure. Now, I, th I think there's got to be a point at which peak oil is going to occur. It's not an area I've studied. So I don't know how, whether we're approaching it or, you know, whether we're there or what's going on with that. But um, climate change is really serious and we're not addressing it with any speed. I don't see us addressing it with any speed and I don't see the politicians talking about it at all. And I don't know that the special interest groups are even pushing them to talk about I mean, everybody seems so scattered. I mean, just this past Sunday, I went to a um, protest march downtown, and I thought it was going to be about the environment, but they were chanting down with the capitalist state. And it's like we're, we're not going to get anywhere if we're so scattered. And there, there is a huge problem with money and politics, and I'm not sure what we're going to do about that. But um, it seems like the, the environmental groups are too scattered. You know, they're talking about extinction of this, that, and the other. Well, we, we're in the, one of the major, one of the major what, five periods of animal extinction in the world. I mean, just saving some one little species isn't going to do it. Um, you know, I think we need to talk about the bigger issue of, of climate change and, and maybe of peak oil. So I do see this um, timetable issue as as being a, a, a catastrophic. Um, and um, the population issue is a major issue. I, a couple of years ago, I was in Barnes and Nobles, and there was some book encouraging people in the United States to have more children. I mean, this is ridiculous. That's, that's crazy. We can always get more immigration if we don't have enough people to, to support the elderly population. We can always increase the, uh, the immigration levels. Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't read the book, admittedly, but I thought it was just absurd. Um, and, yeah, the population issue is so serious that, you know, I'm not sure I really disagree with the one-child policy in China. I mean, I hate to say that, but, you know, it, it was so extreme and, and so problematic um, that, that, you know, I could kind of see its merits. Um, but yeah, I mean that's basically all I have to say. But um, I just hope that we we can focus on some of the major issues and not get so diverted on all these other issues. Thank you. Um, all right, who else would like to give a rebuttal speech? All right, Andy. What about you? He's coming. Where's Andy? Okay. He's Andy coming. Andy's candy. All right, Andy. I, come on down. I've tried to produce as many children as I could. Sure. Okay, Andy, you got the floor. I got the clock. And don't worry. What? Okay. No problem. My name is Andy Anderson. Uh, I'm from the Northwest Information Service in Palatine. And my hobby for the last 35 years has been translating books, databases. Translating, take 10 or 15 books. We're not talking about databases in the environment, uh, the electronic environment. Hello, Nick. Hey. Uh, I'm trying to talk. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you guys, but it, it's breaking my train of thought here. You only got one train of thought, Andy. <laughs> hey, come on, no personal attacks. For those of you that would like to debate several facts that have already been proven as facts, I invite you to come July, uh, June 7th. We're going to be talking specifically about how people that are otherwise intelligent, educated, college educated, good long careers on certain subjects they're very, very well versed. We have experts in this audience. I recognize them here. On, there's experts on several different issues. And when I talk about one of those issues that they are expert on and that I am familiar with, we're in total agreement. But if I talk about an issue where I have facts and there's other Nobel Prize winners that express the reality that 
contradicts the opinion of some of these people. They become what one author has said, uh, people get um, a little hostile. They, uh, they become agitated when you question their world view on certain kinds of things. Yes, you do. Today there is a war for the soul of uh, Americans. Uh, there's a war on scientific thought. One of the slickest magazines out there is a thing called Answers in Genesis. It's put out by the people that are running the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Everything was created 6,000 years ago uh, in the flood 4,300 years ago. All the fossils, everything that whoop, fell to the bottom and uh, the layers of rocks and everything else that we call generations of fossils and everything over millions of years, it was all formed 6,000 years ago. Right. Yeah. If you can teach that and get people to believe it, then uh, they, they will not uh, question anything else uh, that comes up. Piece. There's um, an art. I, I brought four articles tonight. Uh, enough. Uh, I made copies for everybody. If anybody wants one, if it's in something you might want, they're off of a website called Common Dreams from a couple of days ago. One of them is called "Does Climate Apathy Hinge on Pervasive American Stupidity?" <laughs> and in they make there's a, a article in there that talks about how this happens. That giving people facts can't combat faith. If people have faith in their worldview, it doesn't matter how many facts you have. Uh, Kate Mulgrew from Star Trek recently had to issue uh, an update, an apology in other words. She was uh, hired to be the voiceover uh, for a new uh, documentary on the solar system. Well, she didn't know they were teaching the geocentric system that the Earth is the center and the sun revolves around it. And, and, uh, say this woman uh, was working with a lot of people talking about scientific issues for 20 years. She got sucked into it before. Uh, who was it that said who got paid a million dollars to express a view here? Uh, none of us get paid. Uh, you know, I'm a volunteer. Uh, so I don't mind telling anybody that they are uninformed on a certain subject that they're uninformed on. The database is what the database is. Knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. Project Censored has been publishing this book for 37 years, the top 25 blacked out stories. And some of the points that were made here tonight, well, I'll finish them in thought. Every year, there's 25 <laughs> stories in here that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. And for the, between 2006, 2011, the, there was massive numbers of stories on the forensic evidence of 9-11. There are some people in America that still haven't looked at the forensic evidence and they still believe the official <coughs> myth, which is now known to be a myth all over the world. That's just one thing. There are others. How much time will it take? Uh, actually, you've gone over about 4 minutes, 15 okay. seconds. Okay. Check. Yes, honey. So, Thank you, and if anybody wants any uh, copies of these four articles, Thank see me in the back. Okay. All right, all right. Anybody else want to give a rebuttal speech? speech about Okay, well, I'm going to give a very brief rebuttal speech, and then we'll hand it over to Dennis Nelson. All right, first of all, uh, like Charlie, I'm going to be eclectic and skip around a bit. Um, I'd first of all like to, uh, Tim, are you timing me? Yes. Okay. Computer working and everything. It's all set now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, as I as as you meant as um, I guess you all know that what was uh, the Earth Day came recently. What was the day, Dennis? Tuesday. Twenty second. Excuse me. The twenty second. That's right. Yes. And and Ellen had told me before about about the rally, which seemed to be kind of a kind of a uh, if I may say kind of a watermelon rally. It was green on the outside and red on the inside. Uh, <laughs> and and so. So there's, there's also, um, and, and, and I heard from another friend of mine who also was at that rally and told me the same thing, and, and he found that kind of discouraging. So I, um, I wasn't discouraged. So, well, the problem, you see, now one of the problems, of course, with that, with that sort of thing is that it, people who are concerned about the environment but who are not ready to embrace the uh, governmental policies of North Korea would be turned off by that kind of dismay. Uh, now, um, now, on the subject of, of Al Gore, I know Mike Foley brought up Al Gore and described him as a liar, and I've got to say that 
Now, this is an argument that a lot of global warming deniers have used in the past. Um, Al, Gore, uh, Al Gore drives a car, therefore, global warming is a myth. Perfectly logical, right? Okay, okay, but that is, all right, but that, that, but the problem, you see, but it doesn't really address, see, this is what the deniers do often when they, when they use the Al Gore argument. They, they, first of all, they narrow the global warming issue down to one person, a non-scientist named Al Gore, who speaks out uh, on this issue. And, and then they make it all about that one person, Al Gore, and they say, Al Gore's bad in some way or another, and, and that's, that's their attack on global warming. This is called ad hominem. Uh, it's, it's, it, in the College of Complexes, it's known as personal attack, it's illogical. Because you can't, you can't, it, it doesn't, even if, even if, even if Al Gore uh, drives a car or, 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 or asks a masseuse to give him a hand job, that does not prove that global warming is a myth. All right, now. Uh, now, now, uh, tonight another person here at the college, uh, Neil, actually uh, said that uh, people who feel materially secure don't have lots of kids. Well, that may be true some of the time, but many people that I know from personal experience have chosen not to have children because they couldn't afford it. So it works the other way as well. Second, um, there have been a fair number of rich people who, who have had large families. Uh, so it's, it's, care it's important not to make generalizations about that. But on the subject of, of cherry picking, uh, I know Ernie, you brought up cherry picking, and uh, I would just have to say that when, and I'm not talking about Dennis's argument necessarily, but when you leave out critical facts, uh, that means that either you haven't done your homework or else your, your argument is, or else you're leaving them out on purpose. And, and if you're doing that, then it means that there's a weakness in your argument. Yeah. Now, um, now on the subject of the number of people, you said six to seven billion. I hate to break the bad news to y'all, but we already passed that benchmark. Uh, we're over seven billion now, and according to National Geographic, we're going to have nine billion in less than no time. So, um, now, uh, and now on the subject of population increase, the um, the population increase in the U.S. is actually uh, almost entirely a result of immigrants, not uh, a high birth rate of, uh, of native-born Americans. And I see that I see that Tim is telling me my time is up, so at this point I will yield the floor to Dennis Nelson. Oh. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everybody for participating. I knew it was going to be a lively discussion. I really wish that John could have been here from the Thorium Energy Alliance, but maybe we'll get him in another time. In fact, uh -huh. I actually suggested a panel to him. There was an exchange of emails, and one of the things was to have nuclear-free, whether myself or somebody else, a Thorium advocate, namely him. And I thought if somebody from Exelon might be interesting to the light water reactors, maybe having somebody you know, like Brandon Levitt, who's a solar energy guy from Solar Service, come in. Or the lady who did an article for a recent uh, free publication I've been reading. So or somebody from the Wind Power. In other words, a panel <coughs> of just not hearing me talk or hearing Andy Anderson talk, but having a panel of people, not a debate format, but having a panel discussion uh, with uh, somebody being a, a moderator. So that something that maybe something to be considered uh, for the future. I wanted to finish what I was saying about changing my mind, see. Then we came around Earth Day, I started reading a lot of different books. I read The Population Bomb, uh, read Silent Spring, but I read Perils of the Peaceful Atom and Nuclear Dilemma. Perils of the Peaceful Atom by Richard Curtis and Elizabeth Hogan, and Nuclear Dilemma by uh, Gene Brierton. And reading about stuff like Homeowner insurance clauses won't insure against uh, nuclear pollution. Not nuclear war, but uh, nuclear pollution. Uh, the Price-Anderson Act, which is uh, the biggest farce as far as the subsidy that uh, limits the liability that uh, nuclear utilities would pay in a, in a catastrophic accident. See, nuclear power has been my stomping ground issue for all these years. Uh, I haven't really had to change my mind. In fact, I think it's great because that's how I got involved 
with promoting things like wind and solar, utility rate mm -hmm. reform. It all started with the no nuke position. And uh, I think it's a good thing. Um, I'm not blowing smoke as far as radioactivity is concerned. I don't understand what the gentleman was talking about. I specifically looked up, it's online at the Lord Washington Library Center, Toxicological Profile for Thorium, Atlanta, Georgia, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, U.S. Public Service Health Service in co co collaboration with U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, October 1990. You can't check it out, but you get it online. Mm -hmm. And the information I had about um, the thorium-232 was um, very, very, you know, I thought it was very, very, very specific about, you know, this was not a major technical presentation. This is just designed mm -hmm. for college to have the basic, you know, the health effects from thorium. Uh, the thorium people are saying that the thorium is, is harmless. There is no safe dose of radiation, but it was specific. And anybody, in fact, the gentleman there uh, can, can go to the Harold Washington Library Center and check it out online as I did. Uh, Stuart Brand is one of these environmentalists who supports nuclear power. In fact, he was uh, one of Paul Ehrlich's students at Stanford University. I'm totally unimpressed. Um, Amory Lovins has demolished his arguments um, in um, Earth Island Institute's publication, Earth Island Journal, and also you can go online at the Rocky Mountain Institute and see, for example, uh, they're talking about vastly overstating uh, environmental uh, footprints uh, from uh, renewables as opposed to um, nuclear, things like that. And Lovins gets right to the point in talking about uh, nuclear powers as failing the test in the energy marketplace. He goes into a lot of the, the economic arguments that some of us um, have been making. So as far as I'm concerned, see, Stuart Brand's pro-nuclearism has been refuted. In fact, everything that's been happening has reinforced uh, my, it, it has actually reinforced my no nukes position. And I don't see any reason to, uh, to modify it, to change it. If something needs to be changed, you look critically at what you're doing, and I do that all the time, and you, you see um, what, what, what's, what's, happening, um, what's happening in the world. I think what's happening in the world with, uh, with, with Fukushima, with three uh, core meltdowns, uh, establishes what I read from a union concerned scientist back in 1972 about a core meltdown uh, when I was a senior in high school. Yes, yes. So you say, I don't have to change my position on nuclear power. Don't hire this is not a debate. Sir, 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 don't hire yeah, 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 yeah. well, me. I can time. talk with you. I can talk. You haven't learned anything Neil, in 40 years in the good oh, way. Well, Neil, okay, okay. Okay. Sir, sir, I've learned a lot mm. in 40 years. I read uh, uh, ferociously on the environment. Uh, from the Harold Washington Library Center, Fort Floor, and I can go list the, the yeah. publications, even the Resourceful Dragon, which is an excellent book about uh, China's environmental impact, because I usually get one question about China. There wasn't a question, but there were comments about it, and the environmental journalist had traveled extensively through, through China and did online research and in interviewing people, and it really is a very good eye-opening book and helped me to understand even more about it. So, uh, yeah, yes, sir, I, I do read a lot about environmental issues, and if position needs to be modified and changed, um, I do so. If you happen to support nuclear power, that's your opinion. I don't agree. Why am I opposed to natural gas exports? Natural gas fracking is basically snake oil. That's another book that I read uh, for the Post Carbon Institute. It's uh, resulting in boom and bust economies. It uh, makes people sick. It uh, poisons uh, water, air, and land. Uh, it's harmful for wildlife. Uh, basically, a natural gas is, I don't consider it to be a transitional fuel. This is one of the things from the night. Oh, here's another thing I did have changed my mind about. Okay, let's get into this. Uh, the transitional fuels to a renewable energy future were discussed in the 1970s, sir. Uh, Emory Lovelace suggested fluidized bed combustion. More recently, natural gas has been viewed by a lot of people as a transitional fuel. And I pretty much uh, reject that. Uh, I think that the natural, that so-called cheap natural gas, and a lot of the environmental and economic costs are being considered, is basically uh, a bad thing because it's uh, uh, drawing attention away 
from the renewable sources of energy and the energy efficiency which we should be using instead. In other words, we don't need natural gas as a transition of fossil fuel to a renewable energy future. Um, Keystone uh, XL, it's not a dead issue unless we know it's a dead issue. We look at the influence of TransCanada on the Department of State just because there are oil trains, which I do oppose, I have done action alerts from Sierra Club and others about this, that uh, if, if, if it does approve, there's going to be a lot of tick-off people in Nebraska and elsewhere, and I hope they do get out and protest. But again, hopefully that we could just cross our fingers and toes, not just hope, but I mean that, that the government will do the right thing and the Obama administration uh, will cancel it. It's been shipped. There's a big issue about airplanes. We can't use electricity to go over the Atlantic and Pacific. I never said that. We're just talking about electricity because right. only nuclear right. generates electricity. Carbon-free, nuclear-free addresses all the different types of energy, and I have two. Um, heat, liquid fuels, mechanical energy, electricity. For airplanes, we need more fuel efficiency. We can use uh, second-generation biofuels. And also, uh, it's something we haven't discussed, but we have in the past tonight, and that's uh, renewably generated uh, hydrogen. We have to make conscious decisions. We've never really tried uh, going uh, renewable energy. Uh, back in uh, when Harry S. Truman was president, there was the Paley Commission. This is one of the arguments that the Thorium people would try to twist and turn. Well, and I'll get into, into Albert Weinberg and Admiral Rickover in a little bit, that the fact that um, they favored solar over nuclear and actually looked at solar domestic water heating, which is actually a proven cost-effective technology. Adams for Peace program under Eisenhower came and swept that all aside. Uh, basically, the, the nuclear power wasn't an enterprise created uh, by the government. So the question is, rather than just debating, well, if we should have gone the thorium route rather than the uranium route, why didn't we go the renewable route in the 1940s instead of, instead of the nuclear route? I agree we have uh, overextending biological carrying capacity. We are over 7 billion people. Um, I'm a neo-Malthusian in my, in my perspective on that. Uh, we have too many people right now. Economist Herman Daly, another neo-Malthusian, has said, we can have all the people we want to, we just uh, shouldn't have them all at once. In fact, <laughs> in fact, in fact seriously, one, I, considered, I considered next year for Earth Day kind of scrapping the uh, action um, alert format and doing, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, it's the famous bet, the wager between Paul Ehrlich and company and Julian Simon. The Neo-Malthusians versus the Cornucopians and getting into what companies are doing like to go green because that ties directly into, um, in, into the topic. So I was just playing around with that idea. It looks like more and more that that's what I'm going to be doing. I did the College of College, uh, College of Complex presentation I don't know, a couple years or so, about uh, Al Gore's book about uh, facing the global climate crisis. I know that the remark was sarcastic about his lifestyle, that he's indespicable and everything. I think that <laughs> sarcastic. I understand. I understand that. Lifestyle and actions, again, you know, should, should add up. Uh, if they don't, I don't base my conclusion solely upon the way somebody lives. I look at what at, at, at what like his work has done, which I, I think I think is solid as as a journalist and a, as a researcher, and that you know if he needs to uh, you know be, become more consistent with his lifestyle, then that's something that he really needs to consider himself. The Environmental Law and Policy Center has good uh, afternoon programs from time to time on their list, and I go to them um, at um, the uh, the office in the North Loop. Uh, Argonne National Laboratory uh, did the most recent one, it, it, and it, 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 the topic about uh, batteries. Again, we have lithium-ion get batteries now, but they mentioned their research project in like uh, losing aluminum ions and potassium ions. But that is a key, not only to using uh, all electric cars, but also having uh, storage for. Uh, renewable electricity, and an updated, modernized, uh, smart uh, electric grid. I was looking up some information about thorium reserves. I wasn't ignoring people, but some people asked some specific questions about thorium that I really didn't have the information available. 
There's nothing about what part of the Earth's crust that thorium comes from. Maybe it's the same area where you, where uranium is found. I'm just no, saying that. But as far as the U.S. Geological Survey has estimated, U.S., Australia, and India um, have uh, the, the the most. Uh, India and Australia are believed to possess uh, 300,000 tons each. Each country possessing 25 percent of the world's thorium reserves. So when I'm looking at stuff. I'm not ignoring you. I, would, I have saw a lot of good technical information on thorium, but I just had to dig it out. Um, sorry, Tim, there's no indication that your thorium reactors are going to be cheap, even the modular ones. The union concerned scientists have said even a modular uh, reactor designs, regardless of fuel, are going to be um, even more expensive. Uh, you talked a lot about the uh, experiment that was a, a success and then shut down. Well, how much time do I have? Um, we got to wrap it up pretty soon, Dennis. Okay. Oh, Actually, four. one of the design challenges is it's considered by a lot of some people to be a mothball technology. Only a few molten salt reactors have actually been built. Those experimental reactors have been constructed over 40 years ago. This leads some technologists to say that it's difficult to critically assess the concept. So you guys are going around saying it was a success where, uh, like an MIT study says, that, you know, that it, it's, it's not as certain. Um, don't have enough time to get into a lot of the stuff about Al Alvin Weinberg. Uh, the nuclear priesthood, uh, more or less perpetual surveillance of radioactive waste, the technical elite, right. certainly anti-democratic. Admiral Hyman Rickover opposed the thorium stuff and supported the light water reactors we have because he wanted uh, plutonium to make nuclear weapons. And that's, that's the right. position that we know nuclears have been saying all along, and just I like agree. with the core meltdown stuff that the links between nuclear power are not just historic, but also uh, technical and institutional. Uh, Charlie, his comment, it's going to take 10 years to gather the data, but it's also going to take 10 years for the NRC to write the regs for this thing. Now, we're not uh, fans of the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission at NEIS. We call NRC not really, not really concerned, or the Nuclear Reassurance Commission. You can take your pick. So you're talking about at least 20 years. Okay. Um, All right. How much? How much more you got, Dennis? You don't need Rex. It's perfectly well, safe. Just, uh, a couple more minutes. More minutes. <laughs> okay. It's perfectly <laughs> safe. I'm not an advocate of forced sterilization. I don't. I don't support eugenics. Again, who's going to decide? Um, Larry Roth, thanks for your comments. He's a longtime NEIS supporter. Overall, the Earth is heating up, though. The cold weather this winter, that's the difference between weather, which is shorter term, and climate that's longer okay. term. We've already uh, passed peak oil. Okay, thanks, you, thanks, Andy, you know, for... Let's, let's kind of wrap it up. I am. Come on, Dave. That 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 We're 20 minutes okay. over already. It's okay. Oh, just... if, if you got to leave, leave. Uh, Andy, again, thanks for your remarks. Right-wing fundamentalism and Islamic fundamentalism reject evolution. I've heard a lot of uh, things about baby dinosaurs on Noah's Ark, the great cub, <laughs> flood carved the Grand Canyon. When the Ark was being closed up, dinosaurs were killing and eating people outside, uh, just like the Jurassic Park. And, uh, and that's it, and thanks a lot for coming. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs>